David Russell's here. He ditched us. He's too important. <laughs> Welcome, 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 ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Faith Unaltered. I'm your host, along with my co-host, Del Glover and Joshua Davison, and we have got a great, great episode for y'all lined up tonight. Father Jonathan Ivanoff, Pastor Samuel Farag, joins us for round number two between these two guys. They did their first debate on icons a few months back. If you haven't saw that, check that out, but watch this one first, guys and gals. This is going to be a really really good discussion. So we're going to do this one a little bit different than formal debates. I've got a list of questions lined out for these guys. Then we're going to discuss some hymns and some lines and passages about Mary. Specifically, Sam brought those up in our debate last time about the end of the debate. Father Jonathan said he would love to talk about that. And so now we're here to talk about that very thing. Before we get started, though, Josh has got an announcement he would like to make. Go ahead, Josh. Okay, well, first of all, welcome everybody to the show. It's going to be really exciting. I'm personally excited, and this is going to be a really, mm, let's say, deeper conversation for some people. And so I, I expect there'll be some pretty good questions to come out in the live chat. This should be a good conversation. But uh, just to, to uh, 
you know, uh, tangent from that for a second, I wanted to uh, offer everybody the opportunity to partner uh, with a ministry that my wife and I do called Hope for the Homeless. Uh, and we'll leave a link in the description. Um, if anybody wants to, if, if anybody wants to uh, help uh, financially to assist us, what we do is go out and we purchase a considerable amount of food, whether it be chili that my wife uh, gets the ingredients for and makes personally, and then we put a tray of cornbread or something like that, or we go to a pizza place and just order a bunch of large pepperoni pizzas or cheese pizzas, uh, and we, we get as much easy to hand out food as possible. We go and we find homeless encampments on the sides of the freeway and we go and we bless people with food. We bring them supplies, whether it be uh, small clothing items such as socks, uh, hand warmers, um, you know, uh, beanies and hats for women. We have uh, sanitary products where everybody can get some dry shampoo, some soap, deodorant. Uh, we try to give them uh, at least a New Testament, if not a full Bible and a notebook inside of a Ziploc bag, a gallon sized Ziploc bag to keep it out of the water uh, and, and perhaps a backpack to put these in. There's a lot of supplies that we try to use to, to help these people out where they are and give them an opportunity to perhaps rise out of their situation by giving them something usable, you know, a decent T-shirt to go to a job interview, something like that, uh, blankets, towels, things like that, that they really need. Uh, and it can be costly. And right now, my wife and I are in a financial uh, situation, but we don't want to stop doing the work of the Lord. So if anybody wants to help and partner with us, uh, that that would be uh, really great. Uh, our, like I said, our, our, our team effort is called Hope for the Homeless, and uh, there'll be a link in the description for the uh actual um uh, ability to donate um but as far as the the link goes let me see right here it's uh it's uh, in the description now josh yep. uh if you want to just uh click on that you can do a venmo uh, or you can do a paypal and uh it's under the help for the homeless uh okay i see okay uh, yeah so so then yeah it's it's in it's in the description uh, and, uh, and anybody who wants to help out uh it, it doesn't have to be a lot um, but whatever, whatever you can help with and uh, please, please pray for us. Uh, if you'd like to talk about it and know more about it, you can privately message me on Facebook or my wife, her name's Emily Davidson. We're both on Facebook and we're, we're totally open. We're, we're fine to talk about it. None of the money goes in my pocket. We just want to be forward thinking. And if you want to help with the ministry where the rubber meets the road, uh, this is one of those things we wanted to give an opportunity, but we're going to go out within the next couple of weeks here. Uh, probably the next two or three weeks. And so I'm trying to uh, prepare and get a bunch of supplies ready so that we can do that as effectively as possible. So again, just pray for us. If you can help us out, that would be fantastic. The link for, for donation is in the, in the description. Right on, brother, right on. All right, let's jump in to these questions. Also uh, for our audience, please like, share, subscribe. Uh, to this channel. If you have not yet, we will uh, we will be taking audience questions at the end of this. However, we are running a little bit late. So if you want to have your question answered, we'll be answering uh, super chats. And uh, and if we uh, if you don't send us a super chat, uh, then we might not get to your question given the timing of this thing. And so uh, if you want that question answered, uh, please do that. Uh, and we will get to all of those. But guys, let's go ahead and get started. Just before you do, I'll, I'll just yeah. very quickly tell the audience. So I'm, I'm doing great today because I just found out that I am Father Jonathan's hero due to my sunglasses. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, so the, it's a good day for me today. So, yeah, <laughs> we all need role models, Dale. There you go. There you go. <laughs> that we do. That we do. All right, guys, I hope everyone is doing great. Let's jump into these questions. So the first one. I have, uh, I'm going to actually change my mind. I was going to Sam, but since uh, Father Jonathan, uh, I think would be taking the affirmative and the affirmative tr traditionally goes first on this. But I just want to ask you both. Uh, we'll start with Father Jonathan. Uh, how, what do you personally think of Mary? I.e., how would you describe her in your own words? I think that um, when we talk about Mary, we're talking about someone who in Christendom, between the Orthodox, the Roman Catholics, and the entire Protestant uh, confession, we're talking about someone who is seen in a very divisive way. Most of the people who come to Orthodoxy, for example, have two or three things that are really at, at the high 
end of their list when it comes to problems they have with orthodoxy icons is one. And I think I brilliantly addressed that in our last debate uh, a month ago or so. Mary's the other. Uh, Mary and perhaps a little bit less than that, the intercession of the saints. So she, she is someone who is very, in the minds of many, very controversial. She shouldn't be. I hope as we go through this evening, some of these questions and answers that we'll see that she shouldn't be uh, seen that way. And I look at her as our mother. Uh, we have a father in heaven and we also have a mother and that's her. As beautifully stated in a prayer that we have, rejoice Mary full of grace. The Lord is with you, Virgin Theotokos. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb for you have borne the savior of our souls. Under your tender compassion, we run, O mother of God, Accept us in our troubles and deliver us from harm, only pure and only blessed one. It's a beautiful encapsulation of how we look at her and how we see her and how we honor her and venerate her as the mother of our Lord. We don't believe in a capricious God. And so if God chose her, then he chose her for a reason. God chose of all the women in the world that he could have chosen back then. He chose one to bear his son. Therefore, she's unique. She is blessed. Uh, she is someone that is pure and undefiled and a beautiful example of womanhood, of virginity, of purity. And we honor her for that and for so many other things. Right on, right on. Pastor Sam, same question. What do you personally think of Mary and how would you describe her in your own words? So Mary is the virgin mother prophesied long ago by Isaiah to bring forth the Savior. She gave birth to Christ as a faithful woman of God. She was humble, obedient, a redeemed sinner who admitted her need for a Savior and saturated her language with Scripture. The Word of God testifies of this reality as we see in Luke 1 verse 38, which says, And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant, that is, dual, uh, duly, of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. So as we see in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, this is the same attitude of other servants of God like the Apostle Paul. The passage says there in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul is a servant, doulos, um, of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. So I would like to point out something. When Mary is in this passage calling herself a servant, and Paul in, 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 in the verse that we just read also calls himself a servant, the Greek word that is being used is actually slave. They are saying they are a slave to the Christ. And this is really the attitude for all believers. All believers are a slave to Christ. And this is why despite what may happen to her, Mary surrenders to the Lord and surrenders to the what she has been called to do. And she understands that for her to conceive by the Holy Spirit that the world around her is not going to realize what's happening and that she was um, at the risk of being stoned uh, for this, um, for not being faithful to the man that she was promised to. But she was faithful um, with what the angel announced to her. Um, so Mary truly had um, a heart of a true follower of God, and she surrendered to him no matter the cost. As theologian Joel B. Green says, she unreservingly embraces the purpose of God without regard to its cost to her personality. Her response is explanatory, demonstrating how all Israel ought to respond to God's favor. A particular passage we need to look at when discussing Mary is Luke 1, 28, which the angel Gabriel says, greeting, O favored one, the Lord is with you. So here the phrase, O favored one, which is rendered um, herotomini, uh, which has the same root as the word for greeting, shar and shari, and favor, sharin. Mary is highly favored because she is the recipient of God's grace. And that's the key thing here. She is the recipient of God's grace. And we also see in Ephesians 1, 6, where we see a similar thing that's being said when it says his glorious grace. We see a combination of the words that also shows that that is God's grace going to the people, the believers in him. And Ephesians 1, 6 says, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So we see here what is consistent in scripture is that Mary and believers receive grace from God and she is not the dispenser of grace. 
So that's a very important distinction that we're supposed to do. So I agree that when the subject of Mary comes up, it is it can become very controversial. And in order to offset some of the things that we see as Protestants negatively, we, in a sense, almost speak down about Mary, but we shouldn't do that. Mary was a faithful woman of God, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that what she received here was grace from God, and she is not the dispenser. I also think that we should consider um, the... Uh, this note from the MacArthur New Testament commentary on Luke regarding how a misunderstanding of this can actually lead to very dangerous theology. The angel's first words to her were the common everyday salutations of greeting or hello. Since Zachariah panicked when the angel appeared to him, his low-key introduction and immediate statement of blessing was likely intended to calm and reassure Mary. By addressing her as favored one, Gabriel indicated that Mary had nothing to fear but was to become the recipient of God's grace. There was nothing intrinsically worthy about her that set her above other believers as if she was perfectly holy. Like all people, she is a sinner in need of God's grace. In reality, Mary was a humble, redeemed sinner. She was not sinless from her conception until her bodily assumption into heaven. As Jesus himself declared, no one is good except God alone. Nor is Mary the co-redeemer of the human race, since sinners are justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. She does not hear and answer prayers or intercede for anyone, since there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Gabriel's pronouncement to Mary, the Lord is with you, speaks of God enabling her. So we see, again, where's the attention here? That God is the one enabling her. It reinforces the truth that Mary was a recipient of God's grace, not the dispenser of it to others. Only God gives grace to sinners, as Scripture indicates continually. Another passage that we have to look at when we're discussing Mary is Luke 1, verse 49. And she explained with a loud voice, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. This is what Elizabeth says to Mary when they greet each other. The phrase, blessed are you among women, is a semantic way of saying most blessed. Since according to contemporary Jewish ideas, a woman's greatness was measured by the greatness of the children that she bore. Mary was called most blessed due to who Jesus is. Again, the attention and focus is on Jesus. So this blessing is not to be interpreted as a call to praise or bless Mary, but as an affirmation that Mary stood in a state of blessedness. She was blessed, but she was blessed by God. Again, the focus is Jesus. Pastor John MacArthur says about Elizabeth's um, uh, calling Mary the mother of my Lord. This expression is not in praise of Mary, but in praise of the child whom she has she will bear. It was a profound expression of Elizabeth's confidence that Mary's child would be the long hoped for Messiah, the one whom every, even David called Lord. Elizabeth's grasp of the situation was extraordinary considering the aura of mystery that overshadowed all these events. She greeted Mary not with skepticism, but with joy. She understood the response of the child in her womb, that she seemed to comprehend the immediate importance of the child whom Mary was carrying. All of this must be attributed to the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, because that's what we see that the Holy Spirit goes to Mary, uh, to, uh, into Elizabeth. And we see here again, the focus is on the child here. So again, we see that this indicates that the focus is on, again, Jesus. Our focus is to be on our Lord, not a person whom the Lord blesses or even a person who is faithful to him. We can acknowledge that they are faithful. John the Baptist was faithful. Many apostles are faithful. We have people in our lives who are faithful. We're not taking that away from people. But we have to understand that our attention and our focus should always be on the Lord. Um, and, and we have to also take into consider. Uh, consideration that when Elizabeth says, blessed is the fruit of your womb, she is talking about Jesus. And as we can see in Psalm 127.3, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. So how much more of a blessing can one person possibly have than for Jesus to be the fruit of that person's womb? So yes, she was blessed um, and, 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 and the fruit of her womb was blessed. So this is something that we can't ignore. We have to pay attention to those things. But again, Jesus is our focus. So no matter how great of a blessing that we receive, we have to keep our focus on Jesus. Um, and we also see that um, we have to consider what Mary does with her hymn when she says, 
in Luke 1, verses 46 to 47, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary is calling Jesus her Savior. And this is not something that should be just taken lightly or read over real quick. She is saying something significant here, that she is clearly aware of her own sin and that she needs a Savior. To make any type of claim that in somehow, in some way, that she's sinless doesn't show that she actually needs a Savior. So in fact, passages like Luke 2, verses 22 to 24, prove that when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple to dedicate him, that she was acknowledging that she had uh, sin that had to be paid for because when she gives the offering that is mentioned, that's a sin offering. So she can only give a sin offering if you realize that you have sin. So we're seeing here that Mary was a faithful woman of God who acknowledged that she did have sin and she and, and she did what faithful believers do. She did the proper sacrifices for it. And she was a faithful woman of God who put her faith in her son, in the Lord. Uh, also, we have to consider other truths within the Bible. Romans 3, verses 21 to 24. And now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law. Although the, lo the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for this is, there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That statement is very clear. Other than Christ who lived the perfect life, who is God, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So any statement in which Mary did not sin, so even if you argue that she had original sin, but she didn't actually commit a sin, she willfully by her own free will didn't commit a sin, would be going right in direct contrast with what the scripture says. And in fact, the biggest thing that we have to pay attention to is 1 John 1.10. If we sin, we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So to make the claim that she did not actually commit a sin is to make God out to be a liar. And why are you making God out to be a liar? Because Romans 3.21 that we just read, or 21 to 24 that we just read, would be wrong then. It would go in contrast for it. So we have to be careful on how we're speaking about Mary and making sure that it's not going against what Scripture says. Other things in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we see Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 are quoted by Paul in Romans 3, verse 9 through 18. And he says in there that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. And he says, and is written, none is righteous, no, not one. The reason that David had originally written the no, not one, and why Paul repeats it, the no, not one means that there is no exception to it. Every wow. single person, apart from Christ who lived the perfect life and was God here in the flesh, every single person did sin. So that is why I believe that what we have to do is stand by what Scripture says and how we're talking about Mary. We don't go ahead and, and, and disregard the faithfulness that she has, but at the same time, we don't elevate her and speak about her in ways that contradict Scripture. All right. Thank you for that, Sam. I do want to give you guys a little bit of freedom here to interact between questions as well. Um, so, Father Jonathan, is there anything that let's, – let's do one rejoinder uh, from each of you. Um, but Father Jonathan, is there anything that you would like to ask Sam or push back on uh, from his opening or from his answer? It might be surprising to hear me say there's quite a bit of what he said that the Orthodox Church agrees with. But I think as we go through the rest of the questions, I'll be able to highlight where some of those differences are. Okay, Sam. Um, and I guess one of the things, and, and, and I agree that if, if we talk about the things about Mary, we will some, find some commonality. Um, but the, the the problem that I see, um, and 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 I want you to represent your your view and the orthodox view um, from from your own side is um, the, the the claim is usually made and and you can correct it or, or change however you want. I don't want to speak for you that Mary would have had original sin, but she herself by her own free will never committed a sin. Is that something that, for example, you personally believe? Yes, and it's something the Orthodox Church officially teaches. Yeah, and, and that's my understanding, too. And that's where we have a big problem, and especially with passages like, like what it says in Romans and what it says in First John. If one claims to have not sinned, you may got out to be a liar. How do you how do you reconcile that? The Orthodox Church has a very different understanding of sin than even the Roman Catholic Church, with which we're often uh, compared not to mention the, uh, the, the Protestant West. The idea of what the West often calls original sin is popularly called lately in the Orthodox Church ancestral sin. I like the distinction, quite frankly. 
because what the or the Roman Catholic Church used to, still teaches as original sin is not what we ever taught as as original sin. We have to make that kind of clear. But without going off on too much of a tangent, um, we do believe that Mary, like everybody else uh, in the world who has been born before her and since, has been born into a world that has been corrupted. The entire world, not just human nature, the entire world has been corrupted by the sin of Adam and Eve in, in paradise. And the effects of that sin leading to disease and uh, degeneration and then ultimately death are primarily the things Jesus came to undo in his incarnation and life in this world. So we look at original sin and its consequences and what Jesus came to do about it a little bit differently than the West does. And how this affected Mary is often seen as comparable to what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. It's not quite the same. We do believe that Mary was born into this world uh, affected by the the corruption that this world uh, finds all of us being born into. So this is something that uh, we do teach about her. But we do teach that sin is a choice and that Mary, through her life dedicated to virginal purity, living in the temple and so forth, she lived a life where she chose, because sin is a choice, where she chose not to commit any personal sins. Yet, did Mary still require a savior? Yes, she did. And Jesus is her savior. And uh, beyond that, I want to really get back to our questions. Otherwise, we're going to be on this one question for the rest of the evening. But there, and, and I'll just ask this real quick. I, I, I don't want to uh, park here too long, but there is just one more question I want to ask of that. When you look at First John and you look at the context, it, John was writing to the pre-Gnostic heretics that he was writing to. And the reason he made he put that phrase in particular was they they believed that even though they sinned, they reached a stage of of a, a stage where they won't sin anymore. So John is saying that if you make a claim that you don't willfully sin, you're making God out to be a liar. So based on that context, and especially since John is the one who took care of Jesus' <laughs> mom, so he would obviously know all about her. How can he make that statement without then giving the exception, but Mary was different or something else? He made a very clear statement. So how do you, again, wrestle with that based on that context? Well, we believe Mary is the exception, quite frankly. And, well, it's and, 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 it and scripture doesn't need to say when John makes a statement and he doesn't give an exception outside of scripture, we can put in an exception? Yes. We oh, believe and, that. and that's where we'll disagree, but okay. Yeah, no, I know. But that that is what we believe. So... And, and we'll get into a more a little bit more of that as we go through some of these questions. All right, let's do it then. So, Father Jonathan, uh, St. John Maximovich asked this question in the first paragraph of the first chapter of his book, actually, so the Orthodox veneration of the Mother of God. And I'd like to know how each of you would respond to this. So, same question to both of you. We'll start with Father Jonathan. If God the Father chose her, God the Holy Spirit descended upon her, and God the Son dwelt in her, submitted to her in the days of his youth, was concerned for her when hanging on the cross, then should not everyone who confesses the Holy Trinity venerate her, end quote. Yeah, we're in complete agreement with that statement. And, and so is the early church, by the way, and further, by the way, so are the Protestant reformers. I'd like to go through, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to go through all of them, but I could go through a lot of what Martin Luther John Calvin, Zwingli, uh, as well as some of the other, uh, the, those are the three major Protestant reformers. But we can also go into the very people who succeeded them. Uh, for example, Heinrich uh, Bullinger, uh, Francis Turretin. We can read what they wrote about Mary. Now, these are men who had no interest whatsoever in following or preserving or honoring what the Roman Catholic Church taught about her, yet... When we read what they wrote about her, the upholding not only of her uh, virginal purity, but the upholding of her ever virginity, um, her ever virginity, for example, the fact that Jesus had no brothers and sisters from any union between Mary and Joseph and so forth. When you look at what they wrote, uh, you find that they're, these men, again, who had no interest in furthering what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching, they were breaking away from that, yet their knowledge of the scriptures, these are men who could read the, the, the church fathers in Greek. They could read the original 
uh, Kini Greek of the of the New Testament and so forth and of the Septuagint, they knew the scriptures very, very well. And they knew that at least on some of these things, what the undivided Orthodox Roman Catholic Church taught for the first thousand years about her and what, quite frankly, we still teach for the most part, uh, was correct. And they go into a lot of um, explanation and, and, and support of this particular teaching. So um, this statement by St. John Maximovich just simply makes sense. We're not saying that she's God or co-redemptrix. That, that's another issue, by the way, um, or anything like that. They're just saying if God chose her and we don't believe in a capricious God that just chooses anybody for any reason, God, the Holy Spirit descended upon her. God, the son dwelt in her submitted to her in the days of his youth. It does say in the scriptures he was obedient uh, to his uh, parents, was concerned for her when hanging on the cross, then should not everyone who confesses the Holy Trinity <coughs> venerate her. <coughs> and again, I think when you get <coughs> given those statements, we as Orthodox Christians don't see any reason why those statements, which are scriptural, cannot be honored in the honor we then return to her and the veneration we return to her. It's not worship. It's not anything approaching giving to her what is due to God. We don't do that. But that statement, as that statement stands, is something we totally can stand behind and do. Thank you for that. Thank you. <coughs> Pastor Sam, same question. Thank you. Um, so when I look at this statement, I see this as a perfect example of the wisdom of men. So it seems logical if you look at the statement. But we have nowhere else to turn to for a true authority that's infallible but the Word of God. So I want you to take a look at Christ's attitude when his mother was praised right in front of him of what it says in Luke 11, verse 27 to 28. And he said, and as he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. And he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. This woman said something that is nothing shocking if you look at the standards of the Orthodox Church. As we look at the different hymns and, 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 and the, um, the prayers and, and the homilies even that's contained in it, what she's saying is nothing shocking at all. It actually pales in comparison to a lot of the statements that they say. However, Look at how Jesus responds to this. Pay attention to what Jesus is saying. Jesus is very bold and clear here. He said, blessed rather. That is, instead of blessing and praising Mary, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. As we just saw with our exchange, we have a different way of interpreting scripture and different hermeneutics and everything, and we're going to see that continually. But when we stand on what the word of God says, and, and, and for example, in like 1 John, no exception was made. In the orthodox hermeneutic, an exception can, be, can come in from outside. It can be uh, interjected into the text. That's eisegesis. It goes into the text. You're not extracting it from the text. See, what we believe in is is an exegesis. You, you pull the meaning from the text and we surrender to the meaning of the text, no matter whether we like it or not. It's God's word. And here we see Christ's attitude and, this, and he's directly responding to how people are praising Mary. And, and then we have to take another thing into consideration that anything that is officially recited within the divine liturgy in the Orthodox Church is considered infallible. And again, it doesn't mean like if you, if you speak or something, but an official statement, hymns, all those things are considered infallible within the Eastern Orthodox Church. So we must look at those infallible statements by the church in order for us to understand why we make the claim that what's being practiced here is in fact idolatry and it's inappropriate praise and veneration towards Mary. And there is a plethora of statements of the Orthodox Church that makes about Mary that are extremely problematic. But again, we have the whole list that we, we, we can try to go through at the end. I'm just going to mention a, a, just a few statements. And again, um, uh, Jonathan, if you want to respond to any of them um, um, after, after I go through it all or whatever, whatever you want to do. But if you look at the Akathist hymn to the Most Holy Theotokos, okay, this is, again, an infallible Orthodox hymn. These are the things that it says. I, I have to speak up. Pastor, we're going to get to those statements. Let, let's stick to this question, shouldn't we? 
and, and I think it's, an, it's, it, it's important that this is part of the question because we're talking about infallible beliefs. No, 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 no. You're, not, you're, not refuting, you're not refuting what St. John Maximovich said. How do you refute what St. John Maximovich wrote? And that's exactly what I'm doing right now. And again, if you if you want to respond to it after I say it, that's your choice. But I believe, and I believe others who are watching this, they they want to know what the church is saying is infallible doctrine. And I believe this is showing why there's a problem. So if you look at the Akathist hymn to the Most Holy Theotokos, it calls Mary the propitiation of the whole world, the restoration of men, and the forgiveness for many who have stumbled. It says that she taketh away the filth of sin and that she is the salvation of my soul. Now, if you actually look at the hymn, there's a lot more problems with it, but that's just that's just a just a handful. Okay. Simply put, these statements are blasphemy. There's no way to look around it. This is blasphemy. And it completely bastardizes the pure and true gospel message that we find within the scriptures that our Lord and the apostles were preaching. This is a false, the false claim that this is just hyper, hyperbole or that this is poetic language is, 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 is a false claim because you see that this is actually contained within uh, prayers and in homilies. So it's not used in poetic settings. For example, in the Mother of Light prayer book, in the second prayer to Mary, it says, Heal my miserable soul because I do not dare ask, nor do I have anyone to entreat on my behalf the loving God to heal my many sins and incurable wounds. Again, this is just one of a myriad. If you take the book itself and you read it, almost every single page is filled with statements like this. And it, it, it is highly regarded by the people who are in the Eastern Orthodox Church. So even within their prayer books, you see this language that's being done. But it's not just there. It's also in the teachings of the church. Gregory of Palamas, a great defender of icons and a great person who speaks about Mary within the church. And he does, a, 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 in, in the Orthodox Church's view, an excellent job of taking those hymns that are infallible and coming up with Marian doctrine. If you look at, and again, get his book that collects his hymns and read through what he writes, read through the homilies, they are shocking. But again, I'm just taking an example here. If you look at this 53rd hymn on paragraph 37, it says, She, that is Mary, alone formed the boundary between created and uncreated nature. And no one can come to God except through her and the mediator born of her. And none of God's gifts can be bestowed on angels or men except through her. Now, nowhere in Scripture does it even hint at anything close to something like this. And for, for us to take the argument, this is hyperbole or this is poetic, this is in a homily, this is in a teaching, and if you actually read the full homilies in, 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 in full, okay, read it in context, this is the whole way he speaks about it all the way through. However, the word of God says something completely different. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But here what Palamos does is no one comes to the Father except for me and Mary. And I don't believe that they have a right to insert that. Also, the gifts of, uh, that are given out to believers, that's done by the Holy Spirit. We see that in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to 11. But I'll, I'll, go, uh, I'll let you guys read that on your own. But it says that the Holy Spirit is the one who distributes the gifts. So again, Mary is nowhere to be found in Scripture when they're mentioning this. Okay. So we have to ask ourselves this question. Are we going to listen to the wisdom of men who say that we can insert these things into Scripture in order to make the meaning make sense? Or are we going to follow and obey the Word of God? Again, another problematic hymn that they have is the entry of the Most Holy Theotokos into the temple. Again, not going through every single line, but we have to understand that even hey, that Sam. hymn... I'm going to jump in real quick. So you've given your couple examples, and this is kind of getting off from the question. Uh, we are going to hit these here in a little bit uh, if we can get through this. Um, can you maybe uh, wrap this up a little bit? Or, I mean, I don't mean to interrupt, but sure. we're, we are going to hit these later. Um, and in the, and this is kind of getting off from the question. So what, what I would say to, to sum it up is that when you look at what Scripture says and then what the, the church says, that we are not supposed to treat Mary in the way in which we speak about, the way that the hymns are sung to her, the way that the prayer books are written about her, and the way that the homilies that teach about her, which is the teaching of the church, goes into contrast with the scripture. So no, I don't agree with his statement. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. I okay, apologize good. for being long-winded. That's okay. I get it. It's passionate conversation. I get it, brother. 
All right. Um, mm -hmm. Father Jonathan, is there anything that you would like to say in response? Uh, there's a lot to say in response. Sure. Um, I'm not sure where to begin, but I think since Pastor brought up most of those verses from those different services, we'll address those when we get there. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I still I still want to point out the yeah. question number two that we're on, uh, that we were on, was very clear. St. John Maximovich made a very specific statement. He said, due to the fact, the undeniable fact, that God chose her, the Holy Spirit descended upon her, the Son dwelt in her, uh, submitted to her in the days of his youth, was concerned for her when hanging on the cross, then should not everyone who confesses the Holy Trinity, now here's the key words, venerate her. If God thought so highly of her that all of these things happened according to his will, then what is wrong with giving her a particular honor and even veneration because of the same honor and veneration God himself showed her? Pastor, I don't think you answered that question. I, I, I believe I did. If you actually look at what, what Jesus directly said in Luke 11, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. That was in I, I response want to, to somebody praising here, Mary. The Greek, the Greek that's in that verse doesn't quite come across that way in English, but I really don't want to go into that right now. Quite Fair. frankly, it's going to be too big of a sidebar here. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Well, well, let's move on. I think both of you guys kind of want to move on to question three that Tyler has here. So, okay. So first in the first place, when in church history exactly did Mary begin to become viewed as a protector <laughs> and an, an intercessor um, for believers in Christ? Um, you know, how, how did this view of Mary come to be and how did it evolve over time? So uh, yeah, I think, uh, Father Jonathan, we'll start with you on this one. A lot of people <clears throat> make the claim that Marian veneration uh, kind of started around, uh, give or take, the Third Ecumenical Council, which met in 431 AD. However, we have uh, incontrovertible proof, um, physical proof, for example, that I'm going to talk about right now, that shows that there was a honor and veneration to quote question number two above that was given to her a whole 200 years earlier. And this comes from a, uh, a hymn that's been found on a papyrus fragment that dates from around the year 250. Um, and it's a hymn with a, a, an intercessory prayer on it that is still sung in the Orthodox church today. And the hymn called Beneath Thy Protection in English, um, dating to around that year, I, I would point out would kind of be the, the proof that someone didn't sit down in the year 250 and think, oh, let me write this prayer to Mary and, and you know, invent it out of whole cloth. This reflected a belief in a practice that was already there, that was already in place and is ref reflected in the writings of people like Gregory Thaumaturges or Gregory the Wonder Worker, who lived around the year 200, around the same time this hymn was was um, was written, um, and let me get that um, that wording for you. Um, in English, it would be uh, beneath thy compassion or under your mercy we take refuge, O Mother of God. <clears throat> Do not despise our prayers and necessities. But from the danger, deliver us only pure and only blessed one. So there's a couple of theological truths that are being shown in this particular uh, papyrus fragment that around that point in time, and again, I would contend that this was not invented, but already reflecting a practice that was already in place. You have the special election of Mary by God, only blessed one, the perpetual virginity of Mary, only pure one. And a divine motherhood reflected in that very phrase, mother of God. Um, and this designation of Mary as Theotokos, or as birth giver of God or the bearer, God bearer, really predates Ephesus by 200 years. So already 200 years before the arguments linked to those of Nestorius in the Third Ecumenical Council, uh, which was an issue resolved at that time, uh, this was not an invention of that point in time, the 5th century, but rather... Is Mary is already being called Mother of God, Theotokos, God-bearer, back then. Now, during the 4th century, that term, Theotokos, was already popular in Alexandria. I can cite 
St. Alexander of Alexandria, St. Athanasius, St. Serapion, Didymus the Blind. In, in Arabia, in Palestine, Eusebius of Caesarea, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, and in Cappadocia at that time. So already a hundred years after the dating of this hymn, you find that this is this is common parlance, common discussion, common terminology, which is being used uh, for the mother of God. It, it, this is extremely high language, extremely, um, uh, how can we put this, uh, respectful uh, veneration of who she is and what she is. Now, again, the question that you're asking is when in church history did Mary begin to be viewed as a protector and intercessor? So we know that at least from the year 250, at least from the year 250, if not much earlier. And like I said, you have in Gregory the Wonder Worker and others writings that don't reflect beliefs that were invented at the time these people were writing these things, but instead reflect things that were written down reflecting existing practice already. So veneration and honor being given to Mary as the mother of God, veneration and honor given to Mary as a heavenly intercessor and a very powerful one at that um, is, is very clear from the very earliest uh, datings that we have of, of, of anything in the church. And let me say one other thing about dating uh, documents and things like that. A lot of people point out um, well, gee, that's only the year 250. I mean, maybe they did invent it in that century. Maybe it did uh, rise at that point and so forth. Um, the problem with dating anything and saying, well, we only have documents or we only have written services from the fourth century or the fifth century or something like that, which a lot of people do say that a lot of the services of which we have any kind of extant manuscripts or documents date from around the year 400 on. That's true. But neither do we have any Bibles that date earlier than that either. All of the extant manuscripts of the New Testament, let alone the Septuagint, date from at least the year 300 on. We don't have anything that's earlier. So certainly nobody is going to contend that all of that was invented in the fourth century. But similarly, we have to say, to argue a principle here, that whatever Gregory wrote or this particular hymn that I'm talking about here, Beneath Thy Compassion, this was stuff that was not invented, but already reflected liturgical prayers and practices that were already in place in Egypt and elsewhere during that time. So when we want to talk about points of origin, we have to look at what we do have and what people were saying back then and realize that a lot of this just could not have been invented uh, by people who loved the Virgin Mary and wanted to say nice things about her. These things were already being said very, very, very early on. All right, uh, Pastor Sam, over to you on this this question here. Thank you. So I think what we need to look at is we have to understand that how these things would have came about. There, there were a lot of practice, like, for example, there was the Proto-Evangelion of James. That was out in the late second century. That was a, a apocryphal text that had a lot of contradictions from what's in the scripture. And a lot of the beliefs that now people have um, about Mary come from that, even including the perpetual virginity of Mary, which we'll get into later on. So, and, and again, you see the earliest of the fathers, they actually speak about her giving a virgin birth, but not even having a continual um, perpetual virginity. That comes again about later on. So you see an evolution here, but I think where it really starts coming and accelerating quickly is again, back to Constantine. I know some people don't like to talk about Constantine, but Constantine, when he became emperor, he, with his Edict of Milan, he made Christianity legal at that point. And it wasn't just legal. It was one of those things where it was, it became the most, the popular thing to do. And, and that had a significant, a significant effect because that's when you started seeing um, that Constantine's attitude um, and, and his desire to want to have uh, influence on the church started to, to play significantly. Um, he started building uh, large churches. He started taking certain practices that were in the, in the imperial, imperial court and bringing it into the worship service, the, the holding of candles. That comes from the, the practices that were done in the courts. The incense that's done that, that, that a priest or a bishop would hold, that came from the courts. No, now, it did not. Practice, no, it did not. No, I got to step in here. That's a lie. That is an outright lie, Pastor. There is proof of incense and candles being used in liturgical worship, going back to the Jewish temple, from whence a lot of the liturgical practices of the early church came from. So if you're starting to say, well, Constantine invented this and Constantine invented that, nonsense. This 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 whole Constantine bad boy 
big monster kind of thing. It's ridiculous that you guys keep perpetuating this lie over and over again, that he invented everything. He invented this. He invented Nicaea. He put together the Bible. He No, it's not true at all. The, liturgic, the, the church had liturgical worship from the very beginning, and incense and candles were part of that, as were chanted prayers and a lot of other things. So don't make Constantine out to be the, the big bad guy here. He was not what you people make him out to be. With all due respect, history. With all due respect, you're not talking about history or anything scholarship recognizes. Nobody is saying what you're saying in the world of scholarship. Nobody. No recognized scholar would will admit anything that you just said. That's not true in the slightest bit at all. Um, well, we can put up Yaroslav Pelikan. We can put up Johannes Quaston. We can put up any of the great scholars who've looked into this for decades and what they've said. And some guy who comes along and says otherwise doesn't mean it's true. You have to understand, if you actually look at historians, and that's what, that's what I'm going to promote to people, you're going to hear uh, a voice say something. Go ahead and do some research. Do some I've research and watch it. And, and watch what, what, when you have uh, certain documents um, that come from, from the University of Notre Dame, which is a Catholic university, and, and things that were printed out in, in legitimate publishers that actually say these statements and they talk about these practices. It was on purpose that Constantine chose those practices because they reflected what was done in the Old Testament. And I, this I really have to object. This is absolutely spur. It, first of all, it's false. It's a lie. It can be easily disproven. We're not talking about Constantine here. And the proof that he we're not we're not talking about Constantine. We're talking about when veneration started. I just made a statement earlier that Gregory Thaumaturgus, Gregory the Wonder Worker, and a papyrus fragment from the year 250, both from the mid to early third century, reflect practices that go back very early in the church. And now you're talking about Constantine incense and candles. Can you address what I said of just a moment ago about the early dating? Of Marian veneration. Well, it's, uh, I believe the, the the agreement that we had in this debate is that each person would answer. I don't believe I've interrupted you, so I believe we should talk to each other. Well, if you're going to lie and purport to put forth incorrect things and things like that, I've got to speak up and say this is ridiculous. And the things I hear from you, and the things that I believe are complete, flat out lies. I don't, I don't disrespect you and interrupt you. Well, point out what you think I'm saying. That's a lie, then. No, I believe I'm going to answer this question, and I'm going to continue okay. answering the question when you'll allow me to speak. But I will not get into a battle and interrupt you, because I don't believe that that's a proper way that people should speak to each other. I, I agree, but I also agree that lies and untruths should be told and presented as fact either. And I believe I'm doing that. Now, we're going to disagree. That's the whole point of a debate. And if if if, if you can't debate, and, and you can't engage in, 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 and 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 you control yourself, fair too your in self control debate. in a debate, then why have a debate? Then you have to be fair in a debate, and you have to present things that are true, not present facts. But I, I don't Nobody agree with the up. things you're saying, and, and you are not the arbiter of truth. So this is a debate. You're presenting your view. I'm presenting my view. That's how it works. But to derail it, because your arguments don't hold whatever reason that you want to derail it. I'm not going to speak for you. Whatever reason that you want to derail it, that's your choice. But that is not how you properly conduct yourself. You don't have to interrupt in order to make your point. You have a chance to speak. There is no time limit for you. You can speak for however long you want to. I don't interrupt you. So I, I will continue going with what I was saying. And I believe that let the let the people who are listening to this do their own research. Absolutely. And, I, I agree. They will see that yes, the things that Constantine did bring into the church did have detrimental effects. And they did bring in nominal Christianity. And I know that again, that was criticized too, but scripture makes it very clear that what it says in Matthew, when Jesus speaks, that you will know them by their fruit, okay? And and that, that nominal Christians enter the church, those who are just Christians by name alone. And we see with Emperor Theodosius, he forced the empire to turn Christian. You did not have a choice. So I just want you to take this into consideration. If Joe Biden right now said that everyone must be Christian, you don't have a choice. You must be a Christian or you'll face fines and persecution. How many people would all of a sudden start flooding to the churches because they simply want to obey the law? But they're only going to be Christians by name. Tell me, is this the gospel that Jesus preached? F have an emperor force Christianity down your throat or you're going to be fined and persecuted. And to think that that can happen historically. 
No one's going to argue with what uh, Emperor Theodosius did because that's well documented, that there's going to be no ramifications whatsoever. No, there are ramifications, and we're feeling those ramifications right now. And what happened from that? It just so happens that if you look at the timeline, when those things happened, you had a flood of people who used to be pagans and by force are Christian, and an emperor who, uh, who wants to keep some order and peace and sensibility, what are they going to do? Well, in order to appease them, these, these, these former pagans now lost their, their idols. Now vener let's venerate icons. Okay, oh, these people have lost their goddesses. Let's take Mary and elevate her to a goddess-like status. That, if you look at the timing of those events, go do your research. Those things explode during that time and with the Nestorian heresy because of the attacks that were done to Jesus and because of the, the, the priest that spoke against saying that Mary was the mother of God, the response to that was, again, radical veneration for Mary. So when you look at historically, you see these problems, but there were warnings from people. St. Epiphanes warned people. He, he had already warned them that they were treating Mary as a goddess, and he was warning them to refrain from this, from doing this. But the people did not listen. And now we have this as a result. And that's why we have to ask ourselves, does this make sense? Or do we look at what Scripture says like in Mark 7, where the Korban rule is mentioned, and the Pharisees who had all their traditions, their washing of the hands traditions, and, and all these other traditions. Are we going to listen to the tradition of men? The tradition of men that make void the word of God? And as we've seen here multiple, multiple times, every single instance we come into conflict, it's because what's being perpetuated by the Orthodox Church is in direct conflict with the Word of God. So Jesus warned us, and we saw it when he had his discussions and debates with the Pharisees. Are we going to listen to the wisdom of men, or are we going to realize that these are accretions, these are, these are inventions, and these conflict with what the Word of God says? Okay. Okay. Um... So I'm going to, you guys had a had an interesting exchange there. I'm going to move on to the next question. And I would just ask, please, let's try to keep this, your answers directly to the questions that are presented. Because uh, if not, guys, we're never going to get through this, right? And so I know I've got, I know y'all probably have stuff to do. I've got stuff to do tonight. Um, so let's try to keep our answers directly in line with the questions that are asked. Um, but okay, so... Josh, do you want to take this one real quick, number four? Yeah, sure, that's fine. Okay, so the fourth question that we have uh, for the both of you is, how does the veneration of Mary in Orthodox and Protestant Christianity, or I guess, or Protestant Christianity, differ from the veneration of her in the Roman, Roman Catholic mm -hmm. tradition? So I guess uh, let's go with uh, Father that's, Jonathan again. I first. apologize, that should have said Orthodox. Eastern Orthodox uh, tradition. I don't know why I put Roman Catholic. My bad. Uh, well, it. I. I think. I think the the question is actually really interesting because it's you're asking, how does the veneration of Mary in Orthodox and Protestant Christianity differ from the veneration in the Roman Catholic tradition? Yep. Good job. So let's go with uh, Sam on this one. Okay. So from here, when we look at things from a Protestant perspective or a biblical perspective. We understand that Roman Catholics and the Orthodox have different doctrines on Mary. So we are, are aware of that. For anyone who's studied it, we are under, understanding of that. And the way in which Catholics and Orthodox approach doctrines are, are very different. Catholics believe in doctrinal development. They believe that if they see some type of evidence in it in Scripture, that it can basically evolve over time. Orthodox, on the other hand, will say that these are practices that have always been practiced, um, just like the apostles always. So... There are some similarities that some people say, but they are also very different from how they approach it. So there are different terminologies that are used when it comes to Mary. There are different beliefs in it. The Orthodox and Catholic view in, in a lot of ways is very different. But when you're looking at it from, from a perspective of somebody who holds to my authority is just in the scripture alone. When you're looking to somebody from there, we don't see um, uh, th those different distinctions as anything um, other than an idolatry of Mary. That's what we see at the end of the day. We see that the same thing um, happens when the, when the Catholics have their hymns uh, that they have or their songs, their rosaries, and they have other things that are problematic. We see the same thing within the Orthodox Church. We see that in, in their prayer books, they will say, 
I have no other hope or refuge apart from you, for you are my consolation. You are the joy of my soul, my liberation from captivity, the de deification of mortals, our propitiation and refuge and restoration of those who have fallen, and the ransom of my sins, the covering of my nakedness. They even say that they are being saved by Mary's grace. Again, that's the problem. When we actually look at what we were talking about in Scripture, it's God's grace bestowed upon her. But they're talking now in their prayer books about Mary's grace. And, and they say, O oh, Virgin Lady Theotokos, you are the salvation of all Christians. Grant me the forgiveness of sins. And all these different things. So what we see from a biblical and, and Protestant perspective is that, yes, we acknowledge that Catholic and Orthodox are different. And anyone who just lumps them all in all together, they're not being fair. And that's wrong. They really do need to study them as two distinct different things. However, we do see the same sins being committed. And, and, and our sin that we see is Mariolatry, the idolatry of Mary that are being done in both the Orthodox and the Catholic Church. Okay, so for, for Dr. Jonathan, or sorry, Father Jonathan, verbal typo. Um, as, as far as uh, this uh -huh. question, how, how does the veneration of Mary for the Orthodox differ from the veneration of Mary in the Roman Catholic tradition? Well, you'd have to know what the Roman Catholic tradition is, and I don't think we can go into that here. However, there would be two um, rather noticeable, or, or notable, rather notable differences between what the Roman Catholic Church teaches and what, 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 what we teach. Number one, we do not believe in the Immaculate Conception, as they do. We do not believe in the Immaculate Conception. Number two, we do not believe in the assumption if the assumption teaches that she did not first die, but was accepted bodily into heaven prior to a physical death. Now, in the Roman Catholic Church, you can find both teachings that she died before she was assumed into heaven and that she did not die and was assumed into heaven. I've, I've seen both. I've read both. So, what the Orthodox Church teaches about that, I'm, I'm going to read something very quick from Timothy Ware, from Bishop Callistus Ware in the Festal Menaean. Orthodox tradition is clear and unwavering, and, and unwavering in regard to the central port of the, of the Dormition. The Holy Virgin underwent, as did her son, a physical death, but her body, like his, was afterwards raised from the dead, and she was taken up into heaven in her body as well as in her soul. She has passed beyond death and judgment and lives holy in the age to come. The resurrection of the body has, in her case, been anticipated and is already an accomplished fact. And we say things to that effect during the Feast of the Dormition. That does not mean, however, that she is dissociated from the rest of humanity and placed in a wholly different category. For we all hope to share one day in that same glory of the resurrection of the body that she enjoys even now. So that's what we believe about the Dormition. Now, you mentioned earlier in the question itself, how does the veneration of Mary in Orthodoxy <clears throat> and Protestant Christianity differ? First of all, I think, what, what, what Protestant teaching? I mean, the Anglican, the Lutheran, the Reformed. I mean, there's a lot of variance in how the Protestants look at Marian doctrines. Some hold to a, a, a high teaching. Uh, the Reformed Church, for example, which I believe Pastor Sam comes from, does not. Uh, but in the Protestant uh, denominations, you've got a whole varied um, uh, number of, of practices that range from high to low. So I, I don't know how Protestants look at that. I think pa Pastor Sam just spoke for his, his denomination, and I'm, I just gave mine. All right. Is there any, uh, Sam, is there any... Uh rejoinder that you'd like to give and then uh, we'll jump to the next question I'm sorry what did you say I'm sorry is there any rejoinder that you'd like to give or no no and I, and I understand when it comes to uh speaking about protestants yes there are many different traditions of it so i'm only speaking for for, for myself uh, so i understand what uh jonathan is saying so. just for audience that don't know uh pastor sam uh what what um background do you come from again if they didn't catch the icon video <laughs> so I, I i would consider myself a reformed baptist <laughs> All right, thank you for that. All right, guys, let's uh, let's jump to question five. Also, uh, for our audience, if you would like to ask these guys a question, please feel free to go ahead and start asking those questions now. If you would put at faith unaltered and then who your question is for in the comments. Again, we will uh, get to the super chats uh, that come in. 
uh, we might not get to all the questions, all of the questions uh, that come in. So, but we will do our best to get to every super chat that does come in. Uh, okay. So question number five. Tyler, do uh, you mind if I ask this one? And I promise I won't unmute myself unless called upon out. But the, I want to ask this one just because this one is actually really important to me personally. That's why um, I put it in here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, so I'll just read the question first, and then I'll qualify. Yep. So, okay, so do Orthodox and Protestant Christians view Mary as a co-redemptrix or a co-redeemer? I heard Pastor Sam say. And what exactly does this mean? Um, if not, what exactly is Mary's uh, intercessor intercessory role for believers? Um, my qualification for you guys when you answer that. Um, if you guys reference specific sources, can you just distinguish for the audience which ones are authoritative, inspired Orthodox sources versus secondary? Um, just so I know, because I, yeah, if there's a difference. So other than that, um, yeah, I think we started with Father Jonathan first last time. Is that right? I think I started last time. You start. Okay. So Father Jonathan, you can start this time. <clears throat> this, um, this teaching in the Roman Catholic, that's not a teaching. I take that back. I shouldn't say that. That's incorrect. Um, there is in, in Roman Catholicism a, I'm, I'm trying to find the right word to, to call it, a, a liking for what's called the Fifth Marian Dogma. The, the Roman Catholics have to believe in four dogmas concerning the Virgin Mary. Seeing her as co-redemptrix is something that has been around for a while, but was very, very popular about 25 years ago and was very, very much popularized by uh, Mother Angelica of, of EWTN. And it's the belief, and I'm going to be very quick in, in summarizing it here, it's the belief that Mary's suffering at the foot of the cross was such that that suffering entered into Christ's suffering in such a way that she too now shares in the ability to redeem mankind from its sins, that she, in other words, is taking a role that up until now has been primarily given only to Jesus, and therefore is not only, it's not just Jesus the Redeemer, she is co-redemptrix with him. Now, we do not believe that, we never have, and we never will. This is the fifth Marian dogma that's being popularized by many different groups and, and still is popular, even though, to his credit, 25 years ago, Pope John Paul II squashed it and said, no, this is wrong. You know, this should not move forward. But we do not believe in Mary's co-redemptrix. We don't call her that. We call her other things, but we don't call her that because we believe that Jesus Christ alone is the sole redeemer of the world. And there is nothing else and nobody else that shares in that but him and him alone because of his death and resurrection. So we, um, we, do, not, we do not have that teaching, never have, never will. All right, gotcha. Yeah, Pastor Sam, what, what's your take on this uh, this question? Yeah, so obviously in the Protestant view, we, we don't uh, uh, view that. The, the thing that we see, though, is we know that the Orthodox officially will say that they don't believe that. But again, it's looking at the, the, the different hymns and everything where we see the problematic text that has been brought up before, but you know, calling her the redemption of sinners, the salvation for mortals, the mediator of the whole world. I mean, the, the language itself of what's said that we see in prayer books and hymns and homilies, um, it, I know that's what they're saying, but the, what they're actually doing seems to go in contrast with that. So that's that's the problem we're seeing. We acknowledge that that's what they say, but the actual practices they do, we see it as, as highly problematic. Okay, so just a quick clarifying, just for my own thing, hopefully you don't mind, but so these hymns, prayer books, and other Orthodox sources that you you interpret as teaching the, this doctrine kind of thing without the uh, name? Are they considered inspired, infallible, authoritative sources for the Orthodox, or are they secondary? Well, since the there are books, I'll answer that question. No, they're not. Not in the sense that you're asking that question, Dale. But the hymns are infallible. No, 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 no. We're going to get to those, those, those. Yeah, are, are they, are they, when they're sung in the, in the divine liturgy, they're considered what we mean infallible, by right? The words that we say in our own services, we know what they mean. And a lot of people look at them and take them at face value or take them in such a way saying, and misinterpret saying, it, what we mean by them. But I'll make that very clear when we get to those services. But to, to clarify, 
the the actual hymns themselves, which is a, is a it's, it's a document. You, you it, those are considered infallible. The interpretation of it, Jonathan's going to present an interpretation. I'll say an interpretation, but we're not talking about the interpretation, but the actual words, the actual hymns, the actual document, those are considered infallible. Okay. They'll, no, 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 let me let me clarify. No, they're not. And and here's why. Let's say, for example, that you have a conversation with a Mormon, and that Mormon says they believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, what they mean by that, and what let's say you as a Trinit a true Trinitarian Christian mean by it are two different things. Let's say you have a discussion with a Jehovah's Witness, and you ask the Jehovah's Witness, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And they will say, yes, we do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but not the way Trinitarian Christians believe that. Mm -hmm. So you have a statement, and then you have its interpretation and how it's meant. There is nobody that's going to tell you how it's meant but the people who wrote it, and that's us. Gotcha. Okay, so yeah, so... So the text, kind of like the Book of Mormon, that is infallible, but you guys differ, you know, what is it actually saying? What, what, it, and that thing. Okay, makes sense. Th okay. Thank you so much, guys. And yeah, over to you, Tyler, for question six, if you want, or whatever you want to do. Yeah, yeah. All right. And just, uh, uh, I just want to say real quick, uh, thank you to John17 Apologetics for the super chat. That will be the first one uh, that we get to whenever we uh, we jump into audience Q&A. So number six. So in John 19 25 verses 25 through 27 we have the passage where jesus looks to both mary uh, and the disciple whom he loved uh while he is on the cross he says to mary behold your son and to the disciple behold your mother uh wait hold on just a second guys okay murray harris uh who is a famous Protestant uh, scholar says that these two statements quote are both formal testamentary dispositions uh, couched in the language of adoption. My question is, <clears throat> how do both Protestants and Orthodox Christians understand this passage, and what significance does it have, if any, for the church today? And we'll start with uh, Pastor Sam. So I'm going to give um, <clears throat> a statement by New Testament scholar Leon Morris, and I believe he represents what a lot of Bible-believing Protestants would see as the main understanding of this passage. He says, even in his bitter anguish, Jesus took thought of his mother and saw her as the disciple, saw her and the disciple whom he loved. Jesus then said to Mary, dear woman, here is your son. This is surely a way of saying that the beloved disciple would take her place, take would take his place in her being protector and provider. Now that his earthly course was finished, it is perhaps a little strange that Jesus commands Mary to the beloved disciple rather than to his brothers, but they did not believe in him and Mary did. The crucifixion and resurrection, however, seem to have worked a change in them for shortly after the ascension, we find them associated with the apostles and with Mary. And again, when, when we talk about the perpetual virginity of Mary, we'll get into the conversation of the brothers. Uh, another thing when in, in regards to the adoption language, uh, James R. Michaels says this, And what does the scene imply about the believer's relationship to Mary, the mother of Jesus? Is she the spiritual mother of all believers? Is she whom Jesus twice addressed as woman in some way, the woman in Jesus' parable who, when she gives birth, has grief before because her hour has come? But when the child is born, she no longer remembers the distress on account of the joy that a human being is born into the world. Is that hour in which the beloved disciple takes her home her hour of giving birth to a new community of faith? Is she even perhaps the woman in the book of Revelation, cl clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars, who is pregnant and brings a birth a, a male child who will shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron? The answer is no, 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 and no. None of these things are even hinted at in the text. First, Jesus addresses at least two and possible three other women as women in the gospel, and only the only exceptions being Martha and Mary at Bethany. Nothing more should be read into the distinction that the same dis, uh, distances, tendencies that is evident in John 2.4. Second, it is the beloved disciple, not Peter or any other uh, disciple, and not all believers generally, who takes Jesus' mother to his home. He is present at the scene in all of his particularity and individuality, not as a, representat a representative of anyone else. 
Rather, the significance of the scene is to be found within the Gospel of John itself. As in a farewell discourse, Jesus is making preparation for his departure from the world. Implicit in the words, look your son and look your mother, is a command. And the command is simply a particular instance of the new commandment I give you, that you love each other just as I loved you, and you are to love each other. A command that came right on the heels of the announcement that where I am going, you cannot come. In short, he is saying to two of his disciples, for his mother is a disciple, take care of each other, for I am going away. Yes, perhaps even wash each other's feet. The moment of departure now looms even nearer than before, and Jesus divested his clothes uh, takes, uh, sorry, now looms even nearer than before, and Jesus, divested of his clothes, takes the initiative to divest himself of family and loved ones, at least those within earshot, giving them into each other's care. This is the second step in his, perhaps anyone's, dying process. So the biblical view here that we see from the text is that Jesus is being a faithful son and wants to see that his mother is taken care of. And we see that Jesus here is not concerned about who is related to him by blood. Again, we're going to uh, have different uh, views on that. But we see it here that he would never give it to his brothers because they weren't believers at the time. So that's why it is so appropriate that we see that Jesus gives John to be the one to take care of his mother. And we see Jesus' attitude of this, that it's not about blood relatives. When we look at Matthew 12, verse 50, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus, being a good son, wants his mother to be taken care of. The disciple that he is beloved makes the most sense that he would do that. So that's what we see when we read the text. All right. Thank you for that, uh, Pastor Sam. Uh, Father Jonathan, your turn. This question it greatly bleeds into the next one about Mary's perpetual virginity. So if you don't mind, I'm going to answer this, and then I'm going to go a little bit into the, the second one. Okay. The idea that Mary was a not only a virgin before, during, and after she gave birth is something that is found not only throughout the ancient church, but is something that is found even up to and through the time of the Reformation. Martin Luther said this, Christ our Savior was the real and natural fruit of Mary's virginal womb. This was without the cooperation of a man, and she remained a virgin after that. Also, he said, Christ was the only son of Mary, and the Virgin Mary bore no children besides him. I am inclined to agree with those who declare that brothers, quote unquote, really means cousins here, for Holy Writ and the Jews always call cousins brothers. Yaroslav Pelikan has that portion in his sermons on John. Again, Martin Luther, a new lie about me is being circulated. I am supposed to have preached and written that Mary, the mother of God, was not a virgin either before or after the birth of Christ. He's calling this a lie. So scripture does not say or indicate that she lost her virginity, while Matthew 125 says that Joseph did not know Mary carnally until she had brought forth her son. It does not follow that he knew her subsequently. On the contrary, it means that he never did know her. This babble, this is Martin Luther talking, this babble is without justification. He has neither noticed nor paid any attention to either scripture or the common idiom. This again in Pelican. I can, I can give you all these citations if anybody wants them later. He goes on to say, this is again, still Luther. And I'm, I haven't even gotten to Calvin and Zwingli yet. She is rightly called not only the mother of the man, but also the mother of God. It is certain that Mary is the mother of the real and true God. The honor given to the mother of God has been rooted so deeply in the hearts of men that no one wants to hear any opposition to this celebration. We also grant that she should be honored since we, according to St. Paul's words, Romans 12, are indebted to show honor one to another for the sake of the one who dwells in us, Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have an obligation to honor Mary, but be careful to give her honor that is fitting. Finally, from Martin Luther. Again, throughout his life, um, Luther held that the perpetual virginity was an article of faith for all Christians and interpreted Galatians 4.4 4 to mean that Christ was born of a woman alone. It's an article of faith that Mary is mother of the Lord and still a virgin. And he goes on to say, the veneration of Mary is inscribed in the very depths of the human heart. Again, he goes on to say, we know too well that God did not derive his divinity from Mary, 
but it does not follow that it is therefore wrong to say that God was born of Mary, that God is Mary's son, and that Mary is God's mother. Is Christ only to be adored, or is the Holy Mother of God rather not to be honored? This is the woman who crushed the serpent's head. Hear us, for your son denies you nothing. Luther made this statement in his last sermon at Wittenberg in January 1546. When a lot of people say that the reformers who upheld the ever-virginity of Mary did so early in their life and, and recanted later is simply false when you just date their lives when they born and when they died and when they gave a lot of these sermons that I'm quoting from. Here's John Calvin. Helvidius displayed excessive ignorance in concluding that Mary must have had many sons because Christ's quote unquote brothers are sometimes mentioned. And then he goes on to say where. Calvin, by the way, translated brothers <coughs> in this context to mean cousins or relatives. He goes on to say on Matthew 125, this is John Calvin. The inference he, Helvidius, drew from it was that Mary remained a virgin no longer than till her first birth and that afterwards she had other children by her husband. No just and well-grounded inference can be drawn from these words as to what took place after the birth of Christ. He is called firstborn, but it is for the sole purpose of informing us that he was born of a virgin. What took place afterwards, the historian does not inform us. No man will obstinately keep up the argument except from an extreme fondness for disputation. So under the word brethren, the Hebrews also include cousins and other relations, whether it be by degree or by affinity. And in this is again Calvin, but may it be asked here, with respect to whom he is thus called, for it follows that there were other sons of God, if Ephraim was the firstborn among them. But this conclusion is not well-founded, for Mary is said to have brought forth her firstborn son, who was yet her only son. And Christ is called elsewhere the first begotten with reference to all the faithful that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Mary brought forth her only son. Hence the word firstborn does not prove that others follow. The second and third in their order, but we may say that Ephraim was called the firstborn of God with reference to the Gentiles, who at length become partakers of free adoption. And we also are the children of Abraham because we have been planted by faith among the elect people. Yet this solution seems to me, John Calvin, more refined than solid. I then give this simple interpretation that Ephraim was called the firstborn because he was preferred to all the Gentiles. God was pleased to choose them as his people. And Calvin has also gone on to defend the term Theotokos. I don't think in the context of what we're talking about here that we have to go into those, but he did defend that term. Now, let's talk about Zwingli. Now, Zwingli lived from eight, uh, 1484 to 1431, late in his life. I'm trying to prove that no one recanted any of these beliefs late in their life. Late in his life, in September 1522, Zwingli said this, gave a very beautiful defense of the perpetual virginity of the mother of Christ. And this is important, by the way, to the question. Jesus entrusted Mary to John because there was nobody else to entrust her to. She, he, he, she was his only mother, he was her only son. There was nobody else. So this is what Zwingli says. To deny that Mary remained, and he uses a Latin term here, inviolata, before, during, and after the birth of her son was to doubt the uh, omnipotence of God. To deny that Mary remained inviolata was to doubt the omnipotence of God. And it was right and profitable to repeat the angelic greeting, not prayer, hail Mary. God esteemed Mary above all creatures, including the saints and angels. It was her purity innocence, and invincible faith that mankind must follow. He goes on to say that Mary was ever virgin mother of God in a sermon late in his life. He also said this, I have never thought, still less taught, or declared publicly anything concerning the subject of the ever virgin Mary, mother of our salvation, which could be considered dishonorable, impious, unworthy, or evil. I believe with all my heart, according to the word of the holy gospels, that this pure virgin bore for us the son of God, and that she remained in the birth and after it a pure and unsullied virgin for all eternity. I firmly believe that Mary, according to the words of the gospel as a pure virgin, brought forth for us the Son of God, and in childbirth and after childbirth remained a pure, intact virgin. Zwingli uses Exodus 4.22 to defend the doctrine of Mary's perpetual virginity. And there's some other quotes I could read, but it's just more of the same. 
Then you have people like Heinrich or Henry Bullinger. He was a Swiss reformer and theologian. He was Zwingli's successor as the head of the Church of Zurich and a pastor at Grossmünster, if you know what that is. And he said the same thing uh, that his teacher told him and that uh, he learned, for this reason, we believe that the Virgin Mary, begetter of God, the most pure bed and temple of the Holy Spirit, that is her most holy body, was carried to angels by heaven. This is an affirmation of the bodily dormition. In Mary, everything is extraordinary and all the more glorious as it has sprung from pure faith and burning love of God. She is the most unique and most noblest member of the Christian community. And then more quotes of the same thing. Francis Turretin, one of the great reformers that came after the first three, Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli, said this. This is in the, well into the 17th century, the end of the 17th century. This is not expressly declared in scripture, but is yet piously believed with human faith from the consent of the ancient church. Thus, it is probable that the womb in which our Savior received the auspices of life, whence he entered into this world as from a temple, was so consecrated and so sanctified by so great a guest that she always remained untouched by man, nor did Joseph ever cohabit with her. And then he goes on to talk about Helvidius and the anti, um, anti Marianites and just other who oppose the teaching of Mary as ever virgin and, and gives argument for that. Then he talks about the brothers of Christ. So this is this is germane to our, our conversation. So let's let me go to this. This is again Bullinger. Not more solidly have they been able to elicit this from the fact that in the New Testament, certain ones are called the brothers of Christ. It is common in scripture not only for one's own and full brothers by nature to be designated by this name, but also blood relatives and cousins as Abraham and Lot and Jacob and Laban referred to each other. Thus, James and Josie, Simon and Judas are called brothers of Christ by a relation of blood. For Mary, who is called their mother by Matthew and Mark, is called by John the sister of the Lord's mother, However, what is said in John 7, 5, that neither did his brethren believe in must be understood in more remote blood relations. And he goes on to give more about this particular teaching, the brothers of Christ, how Semitic idiom at the time clearly used that phrase to refer to uh, not only blood relatives, but even distant cousins and sometimes even very, very close friends. Um, I, I could go on a little bit. Let me just go on a little bit. Um, this is again from uh, Turretin. Although copulation had not taken place in that marriage, it did not cease to be true and ratified, although unconsummated, for not intercourse but consent makes a marriage. Therefore, it was perfect as to form, to wit, undivided conjunction of life and unviolated faith, but not as to end, to wit, the procreation of children although it was not deficient as to the raising of offspring. Now, again, John Wesley has some quotes. We could go into those. The point should be very clear, not just the early church, which prayed in Greek, spoke in Greek, understood Greek, read the scriptures in Greek. They knew this language backwards and forwards. The reformers didn't necessarily know it as well, but a lot better than people nowadays do. And they, the, the great reformers, from the early church through the Reformation to almost 1700, there was a teaching about Mary's ever perpetual virginity, that the idea that Joseph did not know her until she had given birth has nothing to do with how action changed afterwards, that she was before, during, and after giving birth to the Lord, a perpetual virgin. Therefore, in answer to the question, Jesus had no brothers and sisters other than the step brothers and sisters from Joseph. That is our teaching. That is our tradition from the Proto-Evangelion of James. Because there are, by the way, no other sources. And also, by the way, let me remind everybody listening to this debate. Mary did not die <coughs> at the same time her son did. Mary lived <coughs> for many years afterwards. She lived with John. She lived in Ephesus. People saw her. They spoke to her. Undoubtedly, they asked her, tell us about when your son was a baby. Tell us about when Jesus was growing up. Tell us about the flight to Egypt. I heard that from somebody. Where did Luke get all that from? Luke was a companion of Paul. Paul lived in Ephesus for a while. Perhaps Paul and Luke met and spoke with the Virgin Mary, and that's where Luke learned this from. 
So we have to understand that a lot of what informed the church from the very beginning was not only informed by what the apostles taught, it was informed by them because they themselves learned it, if not from the Lord, from his mother. Mary was a perpetual virgin as the ancient church taught and as the reformers taught and remained that way before, during, and after giving birth to the Lord. Therefore, Mary had no further children with Joseph. Therefore, Jesus had to make a decision about the disposition of his mother and gave her and entrusted her, obviously, to the disciple whom he loved. All right. Thank you for that, Father Jonathan. Just a, a quick question. Um, was that also your answer? I know you said he's going to go to a little bit. Is there anything else that you have to uh, want to say whenever it comes to the perpetual virginity of Mary? I, I think I just said it uh, okay. because that, that question number seven, <coughs> I believe, was tied into the answer of question number six. Okay, yeah. That's why enough. I did what I did. No, and, and fair <laughs> enough. I just uh, I wanted to go ahead and, if so, uh, give Sam the opportunity to respond to both two uh, of course. as well. So, all right, uh, Pastor Sam, you are up, my friend. All right, thank you. So, um, in regards to the perpetual virginity of Mary, uh, church history provides evidence that the perpetual virginity of Mary is yet another evolution and doctrine of man. The second century church fathers, Irenaeus and Justin Martyr, both mentioned a virgin birth, but nowhere in any of their writings do they ever speak of or hint at affirming the view that Mary was a perpetual virgin. So if we're looking at those in early church who, as, as was said, who would have um, had um, interacted with disciples and other people, they never spoke of the perpetual virginity of Mary. In fact, scripture itself, only speaks about Mary being a virgin uh, up until the birth and never continues to refer to her in that manner. Um, we also have to take into consideration, as it was brought up, the doctrine of where the perpetual virginity came from for Mary. And it is from that late second century apocryphic text, the Protoevangelion of James. Now, again, read the document. It's a short document. Read the document and compare it to what the gospel say. It is filled with errors. Okay, it is filled with conflicts from what's in the gospel. And it also, um, when scholars look at it, and not just any scholars, anyone who understands um, the Old Testament well will realize that the, the writer there, even though he claims to be James, does not understand Orthodox, uh, doesn't understand um, Old Testament practices, that he's clearly not familiar with it. So this is not something that people should be basing doctrine on. And that's the earliest evidence and what we believe is clearly where this idea actually came from. Um, in this document, Mary remains a lifelong virgin, and Joseph here is an old man who marries her without physical desire, and the brothers of Jesus um, that are mentioned in the Gospels are explained as Joseph's sons, as, as was explained before um, from an earlier marriage. Uh, growing up in the Orthodox Church myself, I actually thought that this was something in Scripture, because the way it's taught is that this is, this is what happens. So I thought it was in Scripture, but I didn't read my scripture back then until I realized it's not there at all. It clearly isn't. And when we look at the evidence, it comes from the Proto-Evangelion of James, which does, again, make sense why the, the, the earliest of the early fathers don't talk about it. And it only comes about later on. Um, so I, I, I see many problems with this and many other people see a lot of problems with this. Also, in addition, the multiple mentions of brothers as Adolfo um, that's in um, the scriptures, okay? It's, it is a word that actually very rarely ever means anything else other than a biological or a spiritual sibling. Now, obviously, they weren't brothers uh, spiritually because they weren't believers then. So it, to say that they were cousins, uh, it, it's, it's highly unlikely that that would have been the reading of it. And in fact, when you actually do a word study, the only way you can actually know whether they're referring to brothers or cousins is by looking at the context. And as we'll see, when you actually look at scripture, it actually does not point in favor that they were actually cousins, but in fact, his actual brothers. Um, we did tell, talk about uh, Helvidius that was mentioned here that he did see the issues with it. And he, in fact, uh, mentioned in his writings that Tertullian and Victorinus um, had, had also wrote in against it. But Jerome was very much uh, against it, attacked him um, in, in actually a very disrespectful way in the, in the manner in which he was talking about him. And we don't have, and it should be known that we don't have any of um, Helvidius' writings. We only, we only know of what he wrote based on what Jerome actually wrote. So again, it, 
in, in, if you're going to study this, study the Proto Evangelion of James, study these writings, look at what's happening in church history, and you can start seeing a picture happening. But the main place that we need to go to is the scriptures themselves. And the best people that we can look at are the writers of scripture and see what do they say, because brothers of Jesus are mentioned quite a bit of times. And we'll talk about Matthew 1 25 that was mentioned, um, but he, he did not know her until, which is eos in the Greek. And we have to understand that the until clause most naturally means that Mary and Joseph enjoyed normal conjugal relations after Jesus' birth. The imperfect tense used here by Matthew is totally against the tradition of the perpetual virginity of Mary. So contrary to critics of this understanding, the imperfect tense for did not know her does not hint at continued celibacy after Jesus' birth, but stresses the faithfulness of celibacy till Jesus' birth. So Matthew's language strongly indicates a change in the status, and that is the most natural and un, uh, natural reading of the text. So it's also necessary to point out that in both the Old and New Testament, such intercourse is approved and viewed as an integral part of marriage. Mary and Joseph, living as husband and wife and knowing each other, is not a shameful or disrespectful thing. It's actually biblical. Next, in um, Matthew 12, 56, it says, while they were still, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and brother stood outside, ask, uh, asking to speak to him. So again, we see here um, the word brothers that we talked about before, and it's important to understand that according to context, the Greek plural noun of brothers it comes from the word a same and delphus womb, meaning coming from the same womb. So it means uh, either physical brothers or uh, physical brothers and sisters, figurative brothers or figurative brothers and sisters. Adelphi sometimes means more than a blood brother. So in such instances, context, again, is needed in order to determine what is the actual meaning. So the first thing to note is Adelpho, Adelpho is distinct from the word anephis. I may be saying that wrong, uh, which means cousin. So um, it is a different word. And uh, that can be used for cousin, uh, nephew, and niece. And this word is never used to describe James and the other siblings of Jesus. Next, although neither Hebrew nor Aramaic had a word for cousin, both customarily spoke of the cousin as son of an uncle. The Septuagint never translates either expression as brother or sister. So based on the context we have from Scripture and understanding how the Greek language works, we can see that it's really shown here that clearly Jesus did have brothers that came about afterwards from, from Mary and Joseph. And then we look at what the, the text says. So if you look at the, the Gospel of Matthew and all his writing when he, he mentions the brothers, and, and you look at the, the writings that Matthew writes, nowhere there do they, can anywhere in the context can you see that they're referring to a cousin. And, and you have to consider this. You're talking about Luke and Matthew, especially Luke is very detailed. Nowhere does he indicate that somebody's a cousin. But if you look at scripture, like when it comes to Abraham and Lot, well, we know that they weren't actual brothers. Why? Because of context. We know it based on context. So when we look there, we see that there is no evidence to assume that these are actually his cousins. And then if we look at Luke 2, 7, it says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. The term in the Greek is prototokos. Uh, from a lexical perspective, the primary referent of prototokos is to birth order. That is what is usually used. Had Luke intended to imply that Mary's perpetual virginity or that Jesus was her only son, he could have used the Greek word monogenes to mean only begotten son, but he didn't. And that's what we have to pay attention to. Even though Luke wrote it, this was inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who wrote this. And if the intention was for us to know as believers that she was a perpetual virgin, then a different word would have been used. There was monogonis that he could have used, but he didn't do that. And that's why it's important for us to keep that uh, uh, understanding and understand that Luke used the proper words he used for a reason. Um, we, we look at uh, in Acts, again, Luke um, uh, mentions the brothers in Acts 1.14. So again, looking at um, what Luke says and what Matthew and Mark says, every time the brothers are mentioned, no indication from the text indicates cousins or, or people from a different marriage. And then we look at John, the beloved, the one who uh, took care of Mary. His language is the same thing, John 2.12, John 7.3, John 7.5. 
he mentions brothers and nowhere in the context does, does it explain or show any indication that they may be siblings from another marriage or cousins. And again, you look at the writings of Paul in, in, in Galatians uh, and in uh, Galatians 1.19 and 1 Corinthians 9.5. Again, mentions the brothers of Christ, but does not show any which way in which that we can look from the context and assume that. So based on what we understand of the the church history, that the earliest fathers that spoke did not talk about the perpetual virginity of Mary. And concerning that all of Scripture and all of the New Testament never mentions it whatsoever, there is no reason for us to then assume um, that, especially when we can pinpoint that the Proto-Evangelion of James came about later on, and it's only after then that this doctrine is mentioned. So therefore, it is another example of just another accretion and not depending and being satisfied with God's word. Right. Thank you for that, Pastor Sam. Uh, Father Jonathan, any rejoinder that you'd like? To yeah, I don't know why he's focusing on the Proto-Evangelium. I just happened to mention in passing it has nothing to do with the, the debate about Mary's ever virginity. The debate about Mary's ever virginity comes from the discussion of the Greek word eos and everything. Brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, cousins, second cousin twice removed, whatever. All of that depends on that one word which we find, of course, in the scriptures about how Joseph did not know Mary until she had brought forth. I would point out that the scripture, that in the Septuagint, Adelphos is the word used between uh, Abraham and Lot and Lot and Laban. So it is a word uh, where the, the perhaps a more precise word could have been used, but wasn't. The Greek word Adelphos was used to describe the relationship, relationship between them. Anybody who's written about Jewish life back then, Semitic life, will make the comment that this was a very common phrase between uh, people other than blood relatives, other than blood brothers and blood brothers and sisters. This is a very common thing that is, that is written about. But I want to get back to the word eos. The word eos, translated into English, means the word until. And the word until in English means a behavior that goes to a certain point in time. And after that certain point in time, that event, there's a different behavior. So if a behavior was this, after that a point, it's this, whatever you know the change is. In other words, there's a change from one action after an event to another action. That's what until means. But if you look at the other uh, choices of the word eos in the scriptures, and there's a lot of them, by the way, you can't come to that same conclusion if that word elsewhere means something else. For example, 2 Samuel 6.23, and Micah, the daughter of Saul, had no children until the day of her death. Well, she did have children afterwards. I mean, that's just a well-known thing. 1 Timothy 4.13, until I come, Timothy, attend to public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. I don't think this means Timothy is going to stop teaching when Paul comes. Or 1 Corinthians 15, 25, for Christ must reign until, Eos, he has put all enemies under his feet. Now, this does not mean that Christ's reign will end when the enemies are all subdued. Or Matthew 24, for then there will be great tribulations such as not been seen from the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. I think you get the idea. The word eos is key for all that we're talking about right now regarding not only the doctrine of Mary's ever virginity, perpetual virginity, but also about the teaching of Jesus's brothers and his sisters. If Mary and Joseph did not have sexual relations after Jesus was born, and the word eos can be very much relied upon to demonstrate that they did not, then there were no brothers and sisters that were Mary's children. There was nobody else for Jesus to entrust his mother's care to. And all of this just becomes a moot point because the word is very clear in how it's used throughout the New Testament as well as back in the Old. Thank you for that, Father Jonathan. Pastor Sam, any pushback? Yeah, the response is just twofold. First of all, there is no contextual evidence that shows anything but 
uh, what's been discussed to, to say, for example, Abraham and Lot, we know that they, they weren't brothers based on the context. We need the context to determine that. And also the idea that Jesus, if he had, um, if that he had brothers that he would have given Mary over to his brothers to take care of her, again, flies in the face of what Jesus teaches. Matthew 12, 50, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus, as a faithful son, would not have done that to his mother. So to, to use that as an argument, in my opinion, it, it is not convincing. And, and also the, the silence, complete silence that out of all the times, every single gospel and Paul and the people who mentioned the brothers of Christ, not one person, not one person gave any, any evidence that they actually came from a previous marriage or anything. And the only place that we can find that is the Proto-Evangelion of James. And it's only after then we get the evidence. To me, it seems like the 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 it's overwhelming. And even if you actually look at the the way the Greek word is used, it seems to me it seems overwhelming. The evidence. Okay. <clears throat> All right, gentlemen. Thank you for that. Now, here's my uh, my question. We're at the final question before we start getting into some of these texts uh, that Sam uh, had mentioned earlier. And I know Father Jonathan that you had already touched on this question uh and uh, i believe you said that uh orthodox deny the uh, bodily assumption of mary is that no i did not say that oh you I did not was i apologize go ahead uh, i i believe i believe what he had said was that they denied that she didn't die before being assumed now we okay. clearly teach that mary died okay okay i apologize then i'll just shut up and what i said question. was there's okay. a there's there's two teachings in the roman catholic church you can you can find both that she okay. did have a physical death before her assumption and that she did not so you can find both i okay. think officially i think and i'm not sure about this because like i said when i tried to look it up i found you know a lot yeah. both ways but i think the official teaching in the catholic catechesis is that she died before her assumption okay all right well i apologize i did not mean to misrepresent you uh, no, so, that's okay. Okay, I'll just I'll I'll shut up and ask the question. <laughs> All right. So, uh, how do Orthodox and Protestant Christians view the assumption of Mary? Um, and then we'll just start with Father Jonathan and Sam, if you want to. Or I'll, I'll give it to you after that. Well, as I said earlier, we we teach that Mary came to the end of her, her earthly life and was told by an angel sent by God that the end of her earthly life was was coming about. Um, and that she did die. Mary died, just like all of us are going to die one day. Mary died. And that death is a result, we would say, of, of the uh, sinful, corrupt world that we live in, that all of us are subject to death, and only through Christ is there release from that. So Mary died. She suffered a painless yet physical death, and her soul was separated from her body, as with ours, but was reunited with her resurrected body, and she was brought body and soul into the kingdom of heaven. I mean, that, that's a very quick synopsis of what we believe about the, what we call the Dormition, not the Assumption, but the Dormition of Mary. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Pastor Sam, how do you guys view the Assumption of Mary? Okay. And with my answer, um, if, if, if all agree on this, if they want to, um, I am going to mention a, another hymn here. And this is actually, I would love to hear the interpretation of this hymn. Um, because again, the hyperbolic language with, with this language, uh, I would love to hear what the interpretation is. If you, if you want to start here or not, but that uh, that would be my my request. I would say yeah. um, real quick, just just to answer that question. I would say, if you can save it for the end of of this part, right? Then we can just get into that text since this is the last question. Uh, we can just jump straight into that hymn specifically uh, after after your answer, if you want to. Okay, I'll try to see. I, I may have to just touch upon it real quick, but yeah, there doesn't have no, to be a response fine. to it. But yeah, I, sure. I get what you're saying. Um, so the Protestant or biblical view in this is very simple. Is that Mary uh, is our faithful sister in Christ, was a redeemed sinner who died, but is now in paradise with all other faithful followers of Christ, his elect, his sheep, his saints. And on Judgment Day, we all who follow Christ, our Lord and Savior, will have renewed glorified bodies as promised by Scripture. So that's our view. However, again, this is the parts that we see in, in the Orthodox Church where we see that there's a problem. Again, infallible hymn, would they have the Dormition of our Most Holy Lady, the Theotokos, and Ever Virgin. In the hymn, it says, by thy deathless Dormition, thou hast sanctified the whole world. And, and again, that's the problem that we have when we hear those things. 
the Dormition happened after the crucifixion, after all the things, and by the Dormition itself, the whole world is sanctified. So even if you look at hyperbole and, and poetic language, that seems extremely problematic, and I, I don't see how the connection could possibly be made there. Um, and then they say that she's the rest, uh, she restored the life by her holy Dormition. Again, the act of the Dormition had some type of way where she restored life. And she's talked about her spotless soul. Again, we talked about how with what scripture says that that doesn't that it seems like it conflicts, um, and that salvation uh, that it says that she bestowed salvation upon all who sing Mary's praise. That she's the one who bestows it. So because of these problematic things, we we see a major problem when it comes to how the Dormition of of Mary is viewed by the Orthodox Church. All right, thank you for that. Um, Father Jonathan, any uh, pushback or rejoinder? No. Okay, all righty. So let's let's just go ahead and jump into that text. Uh, Pastor Sam, will you, uh, just for my sake, will you quote that again and tell me what um, the uh, the source of that, like, is it from the Akathist or? The okay, so th this hymn is the Dormition of our Most Holy Theotokos and Ever Virgin Mary. I know I have that on here. It's Can probably you... the, the second to last one that was on the list. <coughs> Number 12. Okay, I've got it. So, so <coughs> these, uh, there are uh, four, well, do you want me to read one statement at a time or? Yeah, please. Okay, so th the first statement, which is, this is the quote, by thy deathless dormition, thou hast sanctified the whole world. Okay, let's, let's yeah, let's do these one at a time. Um, so how would, Father Jonathan, how would you interpret that? And then uh, we'll get uh, Sam to chime in after you're done. Sure. I think w there's a lot of terms that in the Orthodox Church mean something very specific and very particular. For example, when we say, as we say in many of our Akathists and other hymns, most holy Theotokos save us. This causes scandal to people who don't understand what it is we are saying or what it is we mean by what we're saying. In that example, by the way, we have to define the word save. And so when we're talking, for example, about uh, Peter, who's about to fall into the Sea of Galilee when Christ commanded him to walk on water to come to him and seeing the waves and everything else, he got scared and nervous and he began to lose faith and he began to sink. And when he began to sink, he cried out to the Lord, Kyrie soson me, Lord, save me. Now, he, at that point in time, he wasn't saying to Jesus, Lord, give me salvation right now, because to save does not mean to bring salvation. To save means to deliver. And so there are a lot of things in the scriptures that save. Faith saves, fire saves, water saves, the scriptures save, Jesus saves, and so forth and so on. There are many examples of things or people who save because the context is not salvation. The context is deliverance from something. And so when we cry out, most holy Theotokos, save us, we're asking the Theotokos to deliver us from calamity, uh, uh, war, persecution, temptation, trial, tribulation, whatever it, 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 we happen to be singing at that point in time. So when we get to this phrase, by thy deathless dormition, thou hast sanctified the whole world. Here's one of those examples where we have to define death itself. Now, prior to Christ's death and resurrection, prior to his resurrection, of course, death meant one thing. It meant an eternal separation from God. But after Christ's resurrection, death has come to mean something else. Yes, there will be a physical death in this lifetime for all of us where our soul will be separated from the body. But our soul goes on not to Hades like everybody else before the resurrection. Our soul goes on to be with God, especially for those of us that have been uh, joined to the body of Christ through baptism and so forth. So death then, the meaning of death changes. That's why we call it a falling asleep rather than death, because we're kind of using the word death as we used to use it. Now the term death has changed after the resurrection. So. Mary's dormition was not deathless as death used to be known, but now has become something entirely different. Her falling asleep has brought her soul and her body, in this case, directly into the heavens to be seated at the right hand of her son 
uh, forever in glory. So what we're saying here, not by your dormition, you have sanctified the whole world, but by your deathless dormition, you show us the way, you show us what's coming, you show us what's next, you show us what we have to look forward to. And this is something that brings a a hope to the whole world. This is something that brings a sanctification to the whole world. It's hyperbole and it's very kind of high language, um, but that's what we mean by it. The whole term deathless is key here and the whole term death has changed after Christ's resurrection. All right. Thank you for that, Father Jonathan. Pastor Sam. Yeah, but how does the act of, the, of her falling asleep um, uh, in your view, how does that sanctify the whole world? Well, I just said there's a lot of hyperbole in a lot of these verses, and everybody watching this video who looks at these services of the Orthodox Church has to understand at the time they were written in the 5th and 6th century, there was a, a very much a um, desire of, amongst uh, the one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, which was still one church back then. There was a great desire to give, to flesh out beliefs that were long held but had not been put down into services yet. Um, so when we look at some of these things that are written about her, there's incredible high poetry here, uh, incredible praise, which would not have been unusual in the Roman courts at the time, the kind of way in which people spoke to the emperor, to his mother, uh, to the empress, things like that. Th this would have been very typical of the kind of salutations and greetings and praise lavished upon uh, the emperor and empress and things like that. So the the what we're seeing here is that kind of high, what I would call high language uh, that was used in the courts and that, that is used, that is borrowed to try and describe how we feel about the Theotokos. Okay. I mean, I, I, again, I, I see the, pro I understand hyperbole. Jesus used hyperboles. Usually they're an, an extreme way of, of, of something to show a message. But by referring to her, her, her um, dormition, that it, it, it benefits the world, that's, that's the part where, um, I mean, if it's a hyperbole, it has to have, have some truth to it. So how does, how does an act that happened after the cross, after all these things, her dormition then benefit the whole world? Excuse me. <laughs> well, then, then we have to define sanctification. What is happening when, when we talk about sanctification or make holy? Um, Mary's dormition no longer is something that reveals death to be depressing and ugly and feared and things like that. Her death now is something that brings a, a sense of holiness to the whole world because we're no longer afraid of death. We no longer look upon death the way we had to look upon it before Christ's resurrection. So in that sense, the word sanctification uh, is probably used here. So so it's interesting. When you say that, that's that's the way we view Jesus, that he conquered death. So why are we looking then at, yes, she was a faithful woman of God. Why are we looking at other people afterwards? If Jesus already gave us the ultimate hope, he conquered death, why do we need more than what Jesus did? We don't need more than what Jesus did, and this isn't more than what Jesus did. What we're looking at is a certain kind of celebration and rejoicing that we can take away from Mary's dormition because it presages and foreshadows our resurrection from the dead. That's the sanctification I think we're talking about here. Having not authored this and having been 1,600 years removed from those who did, I can't speak for them, but I can interpret it the way I think we understand it, and that would be the way we understand it. And I, I would just add that when the apostles wrote, they, they talked about Jesus being the firstborn among many brethren. It, it, when the apostles wrote, they pointed back to, to Jesus. They always pointed back to Jesus. They, they didn't feel the need to take somebody who was faithful and then point that they had some other benefit for us. The, the consistent thing we see in Scripture is a constant pointing to Christ and to Christ's death and what Christ did. And this just seems like a major deviation here because the things that are said about her— <coughs> Could be applied you just exchange the name mary for jesus and it would the sentence would fit so um we, again we find it problematic but i do thank you for um uh, presenting your interpretation um, of it can i ask a clarifying question sam real quick yeah uh, for, for you um do you believe that if somebody and i don't want to put words in your mouth or anything like sure. that but um do you believe that if say uh since the orthodox church like points to mary in this in this specific example right 
uh, to look at this. Um, do you think that that somehow takes away from looking at Jesus and, and what he did on the uh, on the cross via the uh, and the resurrection, him conquering uh, death, trampling down death by death, you know, as the Orthodox uh, say? Yes. Do, do you think that that somehow takes away from from what Jesus did? Uh, absolutely. It's okay. just like if you if you look at how um, Satan does his tactics, we're always getting distracted by so many different things. And by having so many Mary and the other saints and all these things, and I've I've lived this and I've witnessed this and I've been at Eastern Orthodox churches, I've been in Oriental Orthodox churches, sure. and I witnessed this with experience too. That a lot of times with the saints and everything, you get distracted from those and you focus your attention there. Every time that you're praying to Mary, you're singing a hymn to Mary, you're taking away a, another time that you could have been praising the Lord. And we don't have enough time in our life that's sufficient for the praise that God deserves. And, and to take away time for it, to give it to somebody else, it doesn't matter who it is, John the Baptist, Mary, anyone else, not denying the, the amazing works that they did and what God called them to do. And yes, Mary was uniquely chosen, just like John the Baptist was uniquely chosen. And each person is chosen for what they're called to do. Not taking away from that, but for me to take away praise that would go to the Lord and then take it to somebody else and believe that that's something that God wants us to do. Not a single apostle said that. Not a single prophet said that. Jesus himself didn't say that. So I have no reason to feel any compulsion to do that. And yes, I would find it as quite dangerous to do since scripture never said to do it. If it was that important and that beneficial, at least somebody would have said it in scripture and we don't see any evidence. Not necessarily. The scriptures were clearly uh, the, the, the good news of Jesus Christ, not the good news of Mary or anybody else. Pastor, you said, you know, you, you go into a church and you see people uh, at services honoring Mary or the saints and you can't understand how they can do that because you think it takes away. We don't think that way. This does not take away. This is not a zero sum game. Anybody watching this video needs to understand this. In orthodoxy, this is not a zero sum game. We're not, by honoring Mary, we're not taking away something from Jesus. We're actually adding to the enormity of this wonderful experience we have in the life of the church. So when we're honoring the saints, we're honoring someone in whom Christ is glorified. When we honor Mary, we're honoring someone in whom Christ is glorified. Everything through Mary and the saints always points back to Jesus. So I'm not sure what you saw when you were Coptic or when you visited Orthodox churches, but this is not the, my experience. It's not the experience of the people in my parish or any other parish I've ever been associated with. So just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean that we don't experience it. It's not a zero-sum game. That's, that's one thing I'd like to make very clear here. Yeah, and, and the thing that I, for example, um, uh, Orthodox thinking uh, in the book, and I know you've had the speaker come to your church and speak there, so you're familiar with the book itself. And I do believe anyone who's going to engage in conversations with the Orthodox Church should read that book. Um, but the, you even see here that she mentions in the in her book that uh, many Orthodox uh, followers are um, they don't understand her Bible so well. But when you speak to them about like saint stories or other things like that, they seem to be more well versed in that. And that was a common thing that I always saw throughout my life. And not only did I see it throughout. I was guilty of it too. There were certain saints that I knew the saint stories extremely well, but when it came to what scripture said, I did not have a proper handling of that. So whenever you're going to dedicate time to something else and focus your attention to something else, it is going to take away from other things. And the idea that the, the veneration or honor done to Mary is something pleasing to God, again, that's where we disagree. If this was something honoring to God, then yeah, yeah you're right, then it's fine. But I, I Based on what it says in scripture and, and the attitude of the apostles and everything we see, and even the earliest of the church fathers, that, that, that doesn't seem to be the point at all. And then, I think it's very interesting in scripture where on a couple of occasions, St. Paul make, makes very clear in his writings, what you see in me, follow what I do. He didn't say follow Christ. He says, follow what I do. He says, follow my example. Follow the example that I have set for you. He says this on a number of occasions. Follow the example of your leaders in Hebrews and things like this. It doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. We follow Christ. We beautifully follow Christ, I think. We perfectly follow him. But we also praise Christ for the saints in whom he has been glorified. Now, the fact that you or Presbyteria Eugenie, in her book, Thinking Orthodox, which I agree with you, anybody who wants to become Orthodox should read it. Uh, it may be true that in some places, there are people who don't know the scriptures very well, but that does not make them a bad Christian. 
they don't know how they don't have to memorize all of the scriptures to be a good Christian. They just have to know how to follow Christ. In the early church, remember, there were no scriptures. And St. Paul had occasionally write letters. And later they were compiled. And later the Gospels were written. The compilation of the canon took 300 years before we finally have the New Testament we have now. But what did people in the year 33, 39, 42, 51, what did they read? They had no Bible to read. But they had a faith they could live. They had the indwelling of the Spirit who is going to lead them into all truth as Jesus promised. The scriptures are good and we say and we teach that people should read them and be familiar with them. St. Um, Basil the Great said that Christians should swim in the scriptures as a fish swims in the ocean. You had people who could not get into monasteries unless they could recite the entire book of Psalms. There are great scholars and, and people in our church and even grandmothers and grandfathers in villages who know the scriptures very well. To say that some don't know it is not a projection on the entire church, that all don't know it or don't care. See, but that's why knowing scripture as well, because when you referred to Paul, for example, saying to imitate me, if you look at 1 Corinthians 11, 1, and you read the rest of it, it says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Exactly, exactly, exactly as the saints have also done. Who well, by their example, like Hebrews 11 and 12 says, who by their example showed us the way to holiness and perfection. Yeah, examples are good, and there's nothing wrong with that. And many times when, when, when a, a person who's faithful to Scripture is preaching through the Word of God and they see a person like Mary does, for example, I, I'm preaching through the Gospel of Luke when I'm when I'm speaking about Mary and her magnificat that she was singing. She is just saturating what she's singing with Scripture. And yes, that is something that we can learn from, that we imitate. That that is all great. the 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 problem is when we have uh, language that is reserved exclusively for Christ that we're now per, putting on other people. That that's where we have a problem. Not that there aren't certain people that that may do certain things that we can learn from. But again, Christ has to be our ultimate example. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. But just because something is written in Scripture does not mean it's ex necessarily, does not mean necessarily that it is exclusively reserved for Christ. If others imitate and copy what he did, what he does, what he did, then those people like St. Paul himself in 1 Corinthians 11, like St. Paul himself can claim, I follow me because I followed Christ. Well, so did this saint and that saint and that holy bishop and that holy monk and so forth and so on. And so when we look at them and if and only if their life is like St. Paul's, worthy of praise and veneration and honor because they followed Jesus Christ the way he did and so forth, well, then and only then does the church uphold, uplift those lives as being something that the entire church should be aware of copy, emulate, and things like that. I do want to uh, jump in real quick and ask a clarifying question and then maybe move on to the next quote. Sam, if you didn't have anything else to no, uh, to respond to, I don't want to cut you off or anything like no, that. Um, but I do want to ask you both a clarifying question. And, and it's a passage that keep, just keeps screaming at me in my, in my mind. So I want to uh, just see if it applies here or could be applied here. So we know in Matthew uh, 25 that Jesus is separating the sheep on the right, the goats on the left. And he gives to both of them uh, this information of basically, in my interpretation, of why they are going to the places that they're going to. And he says to the sheep, uh, he gives off a list of things that they've done to other people. And Jesus specifically says, if you've done this to the least of my brethren, you did it to me, right? And then he tells the goats, hey, uh, gives the same list, says, because you did not do this to my, the least of my followers, you did not do it to me. Can that same concept, I'm not saying maybe that passage, right? But can that same concept be applied to this discussion? And maybe even with all of these uh, quotes that we have from these hymns, is it the, it is the orthodox kind of phronema, I think that's the way uh, Dr. Constantinou uh, phrases that in her book, Thinking Orthodox. I'm going through it right now. Great book, by the way. Um, but, but is that the concept that we kind of have in mind here from an Orthodox perspective? Or did I just totally miss the mark? No, I think you, you got the mark. It, it's, okay. it's something that we, uh, we you know, <clears throat> we're told to, to build up one another. We're told to encourage one another and so forth. Mm -hmm. 
if we are following Christ, we have the potential to, to become what Christ commands us to become, which is to be both perfect and holy, but not realizing what the word holy means, to be set apart, to be set apart from this world, to realize that our lives are given to God in dedication to him and to his kingdom, that we don't belong here, that we really have no home here, that our home is, is there, not here. And we look forward, to, really, we should look forward to leaving this world so that we can enter that world and hopefully hear from him those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, the terrifying thing about Matthew 25 that most of us preach talk about from time to time when we preach on it, and we preach on it every year, right before Lent begins. The terrifying thing about that is you have both the goats and the sheep, both calling Jesus Christ Lord. Now, then it says elsewhere in the scriptures that no one can call him Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Then it further says, and not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So just confessing Christ as Lord, where it does say that someplace in the scriptures in the New Testament, just confessing him and believing God raised him from the dead is not enough. There has to there have to be good works done from the heart, not not just perfunctory. There have to be good works done from the heart in the in the working of good for other people, whether they're Christians or not, are made in the image and likeness of God. When we do that, those good works from the heart, when we need it, when we love these people and want to help them and, and all that kind of thing, when we do that, then we fulfill what the sheep have done, and which, which is a work that is praised by Christ on the great day of judgment. See, again here, Scripture is important because the reference you're making to Romans 10, 9. And if you read that, it, it, the, the passage is enough, but you have to interpret it correctly and actually see everything that it's saying here. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the confession with a mouth is the external confession. So you're right. Some people just do that and that they're not true believers. And it says, and you believe in your heart. That's the key part here. It's not just a, a head knowledge. It's a heart knowledge that you need to have because true faith always, without fail, produces good works. Always, without fail. So, yes, Romans 10.9, that's the gospel right there. That is sufficient because if a person is living a carnal life and claiming to be a Christian, Christ is going to say exactly to him, depart from me. I never knew you. You're a lawbreaker. But here, when you look at Romans 9, it is completely fully sufficient in that passage that explains the whole entire gospel. And that's why we need to be aware and fully aware of the scripture. So, for example, when a statement like that is said, we already know our scriptures enough to go to it and see, no, this is what it actually says. All right. All right. Thank you, gentlemen, for that. Um, there's one, and then maybe we can, uh, we're at the two hour 15 mark, and I know um, I, I want to get to a couple of these. Maybe if I'll pick out one, Josh, if you want to pick out one, and Dale, if you got, if you want to pick out one um, to, to discuss uh, from any of these, from the Akathis or the Dormition or, or any of these lists, uh, I think that would be great. Um, but, but there is one that I want to talk about. And again, so this is, I think, the only mistake I've made in this debate other than waking up late. I'm, uh, again, I'm sorry for that, guys. Um, is, is that I didn't put, I should have went back, put the context, and maybe even just listed the entire, the entire hymn here. Because I have these passages out of context. And, and, but uh, Father Jonathan, I know that if you and both Sam uh, can probably put these into context for uh, me and the listeners. But th this one here, uh, under the Akathis hymn to the Most Holy Theotokos, and this is uh, sung during Great Lent, she is the propitiation of the whole world. It, that, that, that stands out to me a little bit. And so, Father Jonathan, could you explain uh, what, what the, the surrounding context is uh, whenever it comes to that quote, and what exactly is the quote uh, talking about there? Uh, Tyler, do me a favor. Yeah, of course. Tell me, tell me how you understand propitiation. Oh boy! Well, <laughs> with uh, with every with trying to acquire the orthodox uh, phronema, <laughs> it, it's changing, and so uh, let me just go with what I used to. So, um, my understanding of propitiation is, and, and maybe this is wrong, maybe this is right. I don't know, but I understand propitiation to mean like a a pleasing of God, maybe Jesus sacrificing. His sacrifice for us in some way, shape, or form, please God. I'll put it no, like that. 
No. Okay. Yeah. Um, propitiation in, in English has a number of synonyms, synonyms, excuse me, that people would be fairly familiar with. Um, appeasement, um, uh, pacification, you know, making peaceful, okay, soothing, you know. And if you use any of those words in, in, in substitution for propitiation, it, it becomes a little bit clearer what's being said here. Now, I'm at a bit of a disadvantage because I don't know what the original Greek word is. And the original Greek word, like the difference between the word until and the Greek word eos, from which until is translated, mean two different things or can. So here, I don't know what the original Greek word is, but the word propitiation is, is very common in many translations and the, and the synonyms are very clear. So to say she is the uh, appeasement, she is the mollification, she is the pacification, she is the, the soothing of the whole world, then it becomes a little bit clearer what's being said here. I hope that helps. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost wondering. It's weird. Uh, I'm almost wondering if it would be uh, hilasterion, um, since that I think it's the word used in First John uh, two one uh, as the propitiation or expiation, as some uh, translations uh, render it. But it, I'm pretty sure it's hilasterion. Um, but anyway, uh, Pastor Sam. Yeah, and again, we, we find it pro problematic because that that that's supposed to be something that again is attributed to God alone, and now it's being brought onto Mary. And how how does Mary do that? How how does Mary do what only Christ can do? If that's a rhetorical question, I'd love to answer it. No, I'm I'm asking you as an, a question. Okay, good. One of the things that we we've not discussed tonight and I don't know that we're going to have time to discuss it, but I want to bring it up, is Mary's role with her son in the kingdom of heaven. Mary's role with her son in the kingdom of heaven. And I would like to um, submit for consideration the concept that's found in the Old Testament, vaguely found in the New, called the divine council, that God sits amongst a council of other gods, by the way, and it says so in the Old Testament. The gods, our God, sits among a divine council of other gods. And to take that a little bit further, that divine council is an icon of sorts, is an image of sorts. That angelic beings are there. Um, there are elders there. John saw them in Revelation. Isaiah saw them in his vision in Isaiah chapter 6. And in the divine council, one of the images that's put forth in all in different parts of the scriptures of, of the Old Testament, different books, is the idea of the queen being at the right hand of the king. Now, a problem, if you're hearing me say this, you need to consider is that the kings of Israel, both David and Solomon, and then the kings in the in the Northern Kingdom and Judah after them. Those kings were, I don't know what the right word is, poly something. They had many wives. Uh, as a matter of fact, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and he was called the smartest man in the world. And I don't know what they are thinking with 700 wives and 300 concubines. So the, the issue then is of those hundreds and hundreds of wives that the king had, who was the queen? Well, one could say, well, the queen was the one who bore the heir. The heir was usually the oldest, but that's not always the one who succeeded, as we know by the example of um, Absalom and, and Adonijah, and then, of course, Solomon, his younger brother, eventually became king. But what's very clear in the examples of the life of King Solomon and elsewhere is that when the queen stood as, at his right hand arrayed in golden robes all glorious, the queen being spoken of is not any of the king's wives, it's his mother. And the interaction between the interaction between David, excuse me, the interaction between Solomon and his mother Bathsheba when she came to see him in one particular story where he got a throne for her, put it next to his and and so forth, that image of the queen mother being at the right hand of the king is something that in uh, the Christian church 
carried over into the idea of Mary being at the right hand of her son. I am greatly simplifying this, and we could spend hours talking about this. But the fact of the matter is, Mary is seen in our church as that queen who stands at the right hand of her son. She is the queen mother. He is the king. She is the queen mother. Now, that imagery is already in the Old Testament, and the early church saw it expressly applicable to Mary. Now, when we talk then about um, these verses, uh, Tyler, that you were bringing up earlier, yeah. and if we look at anything on here, a lot of those verses then apply to her a special role that she has as that special intercessor that's at the king's right hand. You know, when, when James and John said to Jesus, give us what we want, and Jesus said, what do you want? And they said, we want each of us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left. He said, I can't do that for you because that has been given to others. And we believe in our church that the others, someone's got their mic on. Can you maybe, I'm hearing a lot of noise. Okay, thank you, Tyler. And so um, the two that it was given to was Mary on his right and John the Baptist on his left. That's the deus icon right there that many Orthodox Christians are very familiar with. So Mary on his right, John on his left, those were the two places of honor reserved, not for James and John, but for them. So for Mary to be at the right hand of her son gives her a special place of intercession. And just like Bathsheba going to Solomon and saying, uh, give me what I want, and uh, Solomon saying, yeah, sure, what do you want? Now, by the way, in the story and context, he didn't give it to her. That's a different issue, okay? In context, he didn't do that because he was mad at the person making the request through her, okay? Adonijah had him put to death. But this idea of, of the, the, the queen mother is very strong in the Old Testament. It was carried through to the, new, uh, to the New Testament church. And therefore, we see Mary as being this special person who stands at her right hand and has a special ability, a special place, a special um, relationship, of course, with her son to make um, mediation, to make intercession, uh, and to bring our prayers to her son and request that he fulfill them. All right. Thank you for that, Father Jonathan. Pastor Sam, any uh, follow-up? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the example of Adonijah, because that's the problem that we have with, with the, even that example of, yes, uh, we understand where the, the Mary referring to as the queen comes from the practices that were done in the courts in Scripture. But we also saw that when one went and made a request and the request then was given to Solomon, it wasn't done. So the idea that um, that's the basis of it, and I'm glad you mentioned it, but again, the idea that that's the basis of it, um, again, we find that extremely problematic. And again, it's, it's going to sound like a broken record, but nowhere in Scripture does it actually say that. Like, yes, you, you, you can reference that, but you only took the parts of it that work and then the parts that doesn't work that that her request was rejected and all these other things. Um, th that part is ignored, you know, and and and, and in these hymns, uh -huh. it talks about that Mary's um, will will be done. Like she can bring about her own will to be done. It, clearly, uh, that wasn't the case um, when we look in the Old Testament. So those are the things that we just find as highly problematic. I mean, I, I've heard the arguments before, and I understand that for you guys, that's convincing. But for, for us who are looking at Scripture, um, that's, for us, at least not a convincing argument. But thank you, thank you for sharing your interpretation. So if I can just add to, uh, Sam, what you were just saying, could the difference, and Father Jonathan, if you want to jump in on this, by, by all means, but would the, the big difference that stands out in my mind, would that be that given the example of Solomon, Bathsheba, and Adonijah, that the queen's will was not in line with the king, but yet whenever we apply this to Mary and Jesus, it seems like the Orthodox Church would say that her will is always in line with Jesus at this point. Yeah. Is that the, the, the basis of it? That, that's or? absolutely. I was giving the, the, the sort of the physical origins of that imagery. But yes, you're absolutely right, Tyler. Whereas Bathsheba was trying to fulfill a request, uh, Adonijah came to her and said, give me what I want. And she already said, yes, what do you want? So having already agreed to it, she then was bound to take the request to her son who wasn't very happy about his older brother asking for what he asked for. 
But Mary's will is not any different from the will of her son. She is going to do his will. She's not going to do anything that he does not want done or does not approve of or does not want whatever. Sam, any follow-up? No, I mean, it's, it's, it's the problem that we have. And in fact, when you look at Adonijah's actions, you, you come off reading, reading the story as that was a cowardly thing to do. And to, to take that, again, as a basis or, or explain the historical um, connection to it and having that huge glaring elephant in the room, again, for, for me, that's a problem. For others, they can say, no, we're, we're only going to take this part and not that part. Um, again, each person's going to have to look at that in different ways. I find that as a big problem and others who are familiar with that and have done the research and know why she's called the queen um, uh, in the Orthodox tradition see those same issues. But again, people will fall on different sides of that. Okay. All right. Josh Davidson, brother. Yes. Do you have a quote? Uh, yeah, I actually, uh, this one is from the birth of most Holy lady, the Theotokos uh, during the feast of nativity. This is, uh, what is this? The fifth quote written down here. Um, I'm this, and this is of particular interest to me because I'm, I'm wondering the connection in a grander sense also, but, uh, it says, Oh, Mary, thou hast released Eve from the ancestral curse. And it, also in relation to this, I'm, I'm curious about the relationship, uh, let's say spiritually or symbolically between Eve and Mary. So, Father Jonathan, what does this mean? Yeah, Eve is called the the um, um, our, our first mother. Eve um, it, it is often in, in a lot of our hymnography positioned in contrast to Mary, who is called the new Eve. The old Eve said no to God's will. Mary, at the Annunciation, said yes to God's will and perfectly followed it for the rest of her life. So Mary, in essence, by saying yes to God's will, um, restored what Eve should have been as a handmaiden of God from the very beginning. And this is the imagery that's being talked about in this particular quote that you're pointing to right here. Thou art our deliverer from the sharp punishment of old, the restoration of our mother Eve, the cause of reconciliation of our kind to God, the bridge that leads us to the maker, Thee then, O Theotokos, do we magnify. So that reference to Eve is a very pointed reference that we find quite often in many of the Marian feasts, contrasting Mary, the new Eve, who said yes to God's will, to the old Eve, who violated God's will and caused the downfall of man and the introduction of sin and death into the world. Mary's yes brought the answer to sin and the trampling down of death through Christ's death and resurrection into the world. So it's complete opposite. What Mary, excuse me, what Eve messed up, Mary fixed, essentially. Now, now again, when you look at scripture, Mary wasn't asked a question. Mary was told what was going to happen. And she did, she was, she did accept it, but just like Jonah, Jonah was told what was going to happen, and he he resisted it and fought it, but it still happened. Mary wasn't asked a question. She was told what was going to happen, and she was a faithful woman of God who accepted it. But it was going to happen regardless. It was told to her what was going to happen. It wasn't a question. That's why I find it oftentimes when these explanations come out, they're presenting a question. If you're not familiar with the word of God, you just assume that what the person is telling you is truthful. But then you actually look at the word of God and you realize that's not what happened. She was told what was going to happen. Well, you can assume all you want, but that's what you're doing here. You're assuming that's what it means, that she wasn't given a choice. We believe that she was given a choice and she accepted it enthusiastically and then totally embraced God's will for her life. Let it be done to me according to your will. But the, but the, but her response is not where the question comes from. Where did Gabriel ask her a question? Can you show the, 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 the scriptural proof of Gabriel asking her a question? Can you show the scriptural proof that it was not a question? I mean, you're saying he, he made a statement and she had to accept it. No, she didn't. I mean, I believe that we can tell what, when a question is asked, when a question is not asked. A question wasn't asked. So am I, am I understanding correctly, uh, Sam, that the objection to Mary releasing Eve from the ancestral curse by becoming, let's say, the... Uh, the the proper fulfillment of what Ma Eve's role ought to have been. That assertion falls for you because Eve 
is even Mary and their interaction uh, with divine revelation, let's say, be through the angel or through uh, God's word explicitly or through Adam giving her warning about the fruit and so forth. Um, there's there's something different here in the scenario of their interaction with God's will, or is it is this just a a grammatical thing where you're saying it wasn't a question, and therefore, I, I'm I'm confused about what why why Mary not being asked a question uh, is is a problem for the uh, the 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 uh, teaching that that Father Jonathan just said about. Uh, the 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 fulfillment of Eve and so forth. Well, so so first of all, I I tend to stick with biblical language. So if if Scripture didn't call Mary the new Eve, that's not what we're going to say. So, but we see Christ is the new Adam. And again, what we're seeing here is well, Christ is the new Adam. So therefore, Mary's the new Eve. So you're starting to see people are trying to do the same thing that happened with Jesus, now saying it to Mary, and then they're taking it so far as saying that Mary has actually restored. Um, uh, what Eve messed up. And then they're using the explanation based on she answered a question and she was obedient, but that wasn't the case. She was actually told that this is going to happen. But when it's explained, it's always explained that she was asked a question and it was her, her, it was basically her will, whether she was going to listen or not, but it's not her will. God said, this is going to happen. It's God's will. So again, the attention that we're seeing here is it's constantly being taken away from Christ and being put to Mary, and it's elevating Mary well beyond what the scriptural text says. So I'm going to stick with biblical text and call Jesus the new Adam, uh, and I'm not going to bother with saying, okay, Mary's the new Eve or anything like that. And even the explanations are littered with problematic trends that we've seen um, throughout. Uh, I mean, I believe I see problems throughout. I believe others see it too. Um, but again, that's where I have a big problem with is, is you're taking a lot of these things that are not necessarily true. And then you're trying to come up with a, a doctrine in order to elevate Mary beyond what scripture ever says that she is. Well, I, I, the problem I, I, here is your insistence that this was going to happen, whether Mary agreed to it or not. That almost sounds like some kind of perverse idea of divine rape, that she was going to get pregnant with Jesus, whether she wanted to or not. That's essentially what you said. This was going to happen, whether she wanted to or not. This was going to happen, whether she said yes or no. So I find that to be much more problematic than the way we look at it. No, I, Mary had a choice. Mary had a choice to fulfill God's will, just as we all do when we're given choices daily to fulfill God's will. At that point in time, when the angel came to her and said, this is what God wants to have happen, she said, let it be to me according to thy will. So what happens if Mary rejected it then, if it was up to her will? And well, she I don't deal with hypotheticals like that because that didn't obviously happen. But her will, her life so focused her in this direction to this point in time, prepared her for this, brought Joseph into her life, the time she spent at the temple and so forth. Everything was given to her in preparation for this moment right here. And she understood that. And when Gabriel came to her and said, this is what God wants, she said, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. Be it done to me according to thy command. Okay, so that's so that moment when she said yes, that's when the conception of Jesus occurred, we teach. So Sam, I have a I have a clarifying question because I hear what you're saying about the lack of explicit statement in the New Testament about Mary in that way. And I'm sympathetic to that because I grew up in a tradition that that <coughs> that holds sola scriptura and, and all of these things with very high regard. And so a lot of the a lot of let's say the uh the 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 back work and programming of my understanding of how to read scripture and ask these kinds of questions is fundamentally based on something like sola scriptura. So I have a lot of uh, sympathy for that. So, but I want to I want to kind of poke at what you said a little bit to see what you would say about this. You said uh, and 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 Father Jonathan pointed this out in a different way, but um, not not asking what what would have happened if Mary did not do what God's will was. Can we can we retroactively read that same question on to Eve? Did Eve do exactly as God's will was, or did she deviate from divine intent? And that's why it was sin. So is that a different kind of question for you? Well, if you look at Ephesians, it, it shows that God laid out the, 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 the plan, his plan before anything was even formed. So yes, the fall was part of his plan. Everything was part of his plan. So I don't believe that there are any accidents. I believe he's totally sovereign completely to the fullest degree of that term. So I don't think anything happens by, by accident. So I do believe it was part of his plan. 
So, so then you, you would affirm something like compatibilism ultimately, right? Uh, if you could define it for me. Uh, compatibilism is the proposition oh, that, that uh, determinism and moral responsibility are compatible. Correct. Yes. I believe okay. that we have our responsibility and we're going to be judged by it. Like, for example, uh, we're all sinners. Why? Because with our free will, we have chosen to follow sin. But in order for us to follow Christ, something miraculous has to happen. He has to take those, those, those horse blinders off our eyes. He has to soften our heart. So it's a miraculous thing. It's God's sovereignty, but he's also, but he's just, so we're responsible and he's completely sovereign and they work hand in hand. Okay. Well, we have, we have plenty of episodes on compatibilism, so I don't want to, I don't want to deviate from the, from the, the conversation, but I think that has a lot to do with where the questioning comes from. Um, compatibilism and determinism also aren't in scripture. And so those are the kind of things that when we use them as a lens to create these questions, I think often that's why the disconnect happens because I don't think that father Jonathan would affirm that at all. Um, and so I think I think maybe this is a mistranslation of even the formation of the question uh, at that level. Um, but if I could ask one more thing in relation to this uh, of you, Father Jonathan, specifically, is yes. um, you mentioned uh, um, Mary becoming, uh, let's say, the the fulfillment of what Eve ought to have been. Um, is this I don't, I don't say that the church says that. Well, no, I'm I'm just saying that that's what that's part okay. of what your answer was when I was sure. when I was asking, but but um, so the okay, so so since since Mary becomes the fulfillment of what Eve ought to have been, is this have any relation? Let's say to um, is is Mary then also in that sense a type of the church itself as the bride of Christ, Christ being the new Adam? Is yes. that part of this yes. parallel? Yes. Okay, yes, can you is. draw that out a little bit for me? Well, there are several uh, different allusions to the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, and so forth. Um, on the one hand, you have Christ, and then you have his church, which is called his bride. But at the same time, of course, the church is his body. So you've got multiple allusions going on at the same time that, can sound contradictory, but they're not. They're just illusions that illustrate something in a different way. So you have the church, which is his bride, pure, spotless, blameless, and all of that kind of stuff. Well, what do we believe the Theotokos was? Pure, spotless, blameless, and so forth. So she is an image of the church in that purity that we are meant to have. And through the church, by becoming a part of the body of Christ and having Christ and the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we can become what Christ commanded us to become, which is to be holy and to be perfect. But we can only do that by being made a member of the body of Christ, by being joined to his body. Then we can become holy, pure, blameless, and perfect, just like she was. So she's an image of the church in that sense of the body of Christ. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think I think it does. Okay. Um, I, and, and this is a particular interest to me. So I wasn't, I wasn't trying to deviate from the, the, the question itself about that, that, that quote, but I, because that was related to your answer, I wanted to get a little bit more clarity on that. But, sure. uh, I think Dale, it's your turn. If you want to pick, uh, your quote that you'd like to ask about. Um, yeah, so I, I don't have a, a quote really to ask about kind of thing. Um, if you want, we can go, I know we've got like 10 questions, so I'm, I'm good if. Okay. Both the guests are to go straight to there. Yeah, I don't, okay. I don't have text. I guess right. it's time for audience questions then. Let's look for our super chats. I got them right here, bub. So, okay. Ooh. So the first one we have is, and again, I just want to thank both Father Jonathan and Pastor Sam for agreeing to come on and do this this part two, round two thing. It's definitely been exciting the entire time, and I just really appreciate uh, both of y'all uh, dedicating your time to do this. So thank you both for that. But our first question and our first super chat is from John 17 apologetics, five bucks. Thank you for that, John. Uh, for Sam, has Sam considered if James is Jesus's older brother, the son of Joseph, he could have been Luke's source for Jesus's childhood, Acts 21, 18. I get, potentially, but I would, I would have, the way I look at it when I was looking at historically where Luke was, he would have been in the area where Mary was. So I believe actually Luke got his source for a lot of the birth narrative directly from Mary. So that's where I believe it's from. it would all be speculation. It's possible, but I believe it all came from 
or mostly the birth narrative came directly from Mary, especially since certain things are described that she was there for, and you get that personal sense there. Now, by the way, I would agree with, with that and even go on to highlight how St. Luke himself said, I interviewed witnesses. I spoke to people who were there. I spoke to people who knew them and other people have tried to write this. I'm going to write a very clarifying document. He wanted to get it right. And the witnesses he, uh, why could not Mary have been one of many of the witnesses that he interviewed? Absolutely. And Paul too, by the way. So I would say that this is one one where we, we both completely agree with this one. Woo! <laughs> That's good we, always get, we always get one of those at least <laughs> praise god That's good. all right so now let me put the super chat up on this next one uh because uh john another john we have he um he asked his question in, in another comment uh but it wasn't really a comment or a question is more of a statement uh but i do want to put all the super chats up so first of all uh sec now i did not know this but sec is swedish krona so I, I don't know, um, and we'll see how that all works. But uh, according to John says, uh, I asked him if he had a question. He said, no, only a comment. The way we understand those statements in the hymns about Mary is Christ Christocentric. That is because Christ is our salvation, and Mary gave birth to him. In that sense, we can say that she gave birth to our salvation. She is our salvation in that qualified sense. Yeah, um, yep, he's right about that that's how we mean it okay sam is there uh any any and, and, follow up and i would, and I would say um if according to john and the way jonathan that is how the orthodox church will explain it uh we just believe that there is no uh, biblical basis for a right to do that okay. All right. let me get these off of here real quick and then so that was if i did not miss one which i don't think i did because they automatically start um that's all of our super chats. Uh, do you guys want to answer a few more questions or? Okay. You guys are good with that. Okay. So uh, let's see here. One of them's a joke. We should probably pull out for the last thing. Yeah. That, you're talking about the very first one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to. All right. Question. Uh, what's to be said about no further mention of Mary from either Paul or the other apostles and why is Mary still referred to as, quote, the Virgin Mary, considering that she gave birth? And I guess this question is for both of y'all. Uh, so, Sam, if you want to jump on it first, and then uh, Father Jonathan, you can follow after Sam. Okay, so when, when you're saying that she's still called the Virgin Mary, I, I'm trying to understand what, what is the context with that. I think she's talking about the way that she's made reference to in the liturgical churches. Oh, okay, so that, that's, I would say, well, that's the liturgical, that's because they believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary, and, and if, if Jonathan wants to add more to that, but uh, we see, at least from scripture, what I'm going to talk about is that we don't see that she's referenced as, as the virgin after the birth. The, the whole key point was that she gave the virginal birth, um, and um, no further mention of Mary from either Paul or the other apostles. I mean, it's just Mary would have been in, in a different area. What she had to do that was not significant for them to write about scripture, because I would say, um, she had a role to do, and she did that. She was a faithful person, just like John the Baptist. He was the forerunner. He had a specific role. He was called to it. It's a very unique role. Jesus spoke very highly, in fact, of John the Baptist um, and, and everything, but he had his role. He did it. Everything points to Christ, and that's where our focus should be. So that's what I'll say. Okay. Uh, Father Jonathan? Well, there's no further mention of Mary from either Paul or the other apostles because their focus was on, on the, the spreading of the faith, the establishment of churches, the good discipline and order in those churches and things like that. Mary might have played a part, and we don't know what that part is, but whether she we don't but we don't know everybody who played a part. St. Paul in the Epistle to the Romans and in other epistles mentions a few people here and there. We see these people mentioned in more detail in the Acts of the Holy Apostles. Um, but it may be entirely possible that by the time uh, St. Paul starts writing his um, letters, which was almost 20 years after uh, Jesus' death and, and uh, resurrection, Mary might have reposed in the Lord by then. We don't know exactly. But, the, folk, the, but the, the point is the spread of the church, the propagation of the gospel at that point did not involve her. St. Paul's focus was not on any of the other apostles, by the way. Not only did he not mention her, he didn't mention anybody else. Peter barely mentioned him in one of his epistles. 
Um, so the idea that she's not mentioned by Paul, well, neither are the other apostles. So I'm not sure what the point is there other than the context of what was happening at that time was the spreading of, of the gospel, the propagation and planting of churches and things like that. She was not a part really of that. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. All right. Our next question comes from Jesus Christ Conquers. He says this, uh, or, or she, sorry, uh, Faith and Altered, how does Pastor Sam, so Pastor Sam in your congregation, bless Mary as was foretold in the Gospel of Luke, Luke one forty eight? all generations will call me blessed? Father Jonathan can chime in too. So that's a perfect question. So we're going verse by verse ex expositionally through the Gospel of Luke. So we've already covered the birth of Mary, I'm just starting uh, chapter three, and we're taking our time on it. And the way that we've done it is that we've talked about what Mary has done and explained that what she's done is amazing and that she is truly blessed and talked about the reality of what she in fact did. Um, we spent a whole sermon message on the Magnificat that she sang and everything. So that is how we are doing that and showing the blessing that she has and, and, and acknowledging exactly how Christ used her in his plan of salvation. So in other words, get ready for a six-year sermon on Luke. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, it's it's going to be a long one. <laughs> uh, I was listening to John MacArthur. I think he spent like six, five or six years on Matthew. Yes. So it's good to go in, in into detail. So all right, uh, Father Jonathan, go ahead. Well, uh, how do we <laughs> um, bless Mary? Um, she is in, in, she is commemorated, commemorated, uh, innumerable times throughout every divine liturgy, every service that we, uh, that we have. So um, I, I have a feeling the person asking this question is Orthodox and probably knows this as well. Uh, so we, we end a lot of the litanies during which we pray for all kinds of different things and people commemorating our most holy, most pure, most blessed and glorious lady, the birth giver of God and ever Virgin Mary. So we explicitly call her that uh, many times throughout many of our services. All right. Thank you for that. Um, and, and since you just brought up that, Father Jonathan, uh, I had a question. So a buddy of mine, Andrew Elliott, actually gave me uh, this these questions first. And so there was one for you and one for uh, Sam. But Sam, you had already answered uh, his question. So his question to you was, what is your interpretation of full of grace in Luke 128? I think whenever we um answered that you, you you gave your your interpretation of that um if you want to comment on this no, feel no, free to. okay okay uh so father jonathan uh the question from andrew uh to you was and you just mentioned this term and so i, I thought this would be a good place to ask this how can mary well, just, hold on okay how can mary be called glorious if that term is predicated to god well it's predicated to a lot of things and people, not just God. It's, it's predicated to the saints. Uh, that word is used. Um, we, we, you, you, the word is glorified. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, God glorified. is glorified in the saints, the God of Israel. That's from the Old Testament. So it's not predicated only to God. It's predicated to the saints. It's predicated to the king. It's predicated to a lot of people. I'm not sure of the question, but uh, it, it would be wrong scripturally to assert that the word glorified is only ever applied to God himself. Thank you for that. And, yeah, and, and, and I would oops, just try and say, if you look at the, in scripture, the final step is glorification. We get our brand new body. So I, I, I would agree that that terminology is used for, for the believers too. So I would acknowledge that too. Right. Ooh, we're two for 70. Yeah, two yes. for two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you both for that. And if Andrew, if you're watching and, and you want to comment on that, feel free and I'll, uh, I'll bring that up. Okay. Our next question, we've only got, let's see, one, two, three, and then one for each of you from me. And so we're, we're about done. Um, so I just did that one. So Amy asks, Amy Roberg asks, so when and why and who began denying Mary veneration? her virginity and her sinlessness, and why would they do this? That's also, uh, for context, that's in relation to uh, all of the quotes that Father Jonathan was reading about reformers who affirmed Mary. Hmm. Most scholars who've studied that very question have said, and I came across this in, in my preparation for this, most scholars have said 
this began in the 1700s and 1800s when um, the Enlightenment and humanism, uh, but most especially um, the, the, the studies of the 19th century, primarily coming out of Tübingen in Germany and so forth, regarding the, uh, the, the study of the gospel, was reducing it to manuscript evidence or, or things that had nothing to do with a living continuity that went all the way back to the time of the apostles. There's a word for it, and it's escaping me at the moment. This is what happens when you turn 66. You start forgetting things. But there's a word for what the German uh, scholars of the 19th century were doing to the gospel, and that this, building upon what was taking place in the Enlightenment and earlier, brought forward into our day and age, cast doubt on just about everything uh, in the scriptures, not only those things that are very clear, but also the things that are not so clear and that might be set up to tradition or things like that. So this, uh, and, and again, reflecting on the fact that the reformers held Mary in very high regard uh, way into the 1700s, which is when Voltaire and all of these other things, the Enlightenment really started taking hold uh, in primarily Western Europe, but then later in Russia even. And the, uh, the study of the, of the scriptures turned into a very academic one, very much separated from the living tradition that had been a part of it for since the beginning of the church. Just to clarify real quick, Father Jonathan, was what he was talking about. So I've heard Jay Dyer talk about this a lot on his YouTube channels, and especially with Sola Scriptura debates. Uh, but he was saying that basically Luther's descendants kind of form this higher criticism. Higher criticism. Thank you. That, that's what Is I was that, looking for. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, Pastor Sam. Yeah, I see. The, I mean, the, the question itself has many problems with it um, because that wasn't the original idea of the apostles. It wasn't the original idea in the scriptures. It wasn't what was preached. And the early church didn't believe that. But later on, they started to believe it. And the faithful um, did re rebel against it and rebuke people for it. And they they were attacked. And we they would burn their writings and be labeled as heretics. Nowhere in scripture does it say that the majority rule or because you have a record from church history, that proves that that was right. If you look through scripture for when there were reformations done in scripture, the, ma the masses of the people were all doing things wrong. In Jesus' time, the religious elite were teaching man-made doctrine. So majority rule does not work in scripture. And so what happened, the reformers hold no weight in the sense of authority for us. Yes, I can respect some of the things that Calvin and Luther wrote, but we don't have the same thing that that, that Catholics and Orthodox may look at as a as a saint that they that they venerate in that way or whatever. They're not an authority. The authority is the word of God. And Luther and Calvin had many problematic things that they did that those things had to continue to be reformed because the reformation means going back to the original. And that's why what Bible believing Christians believe in fits in line with scripture and the earliest of church history. So this was an accretion that happened later on. And just because the majority ruled does not take away from that fact. The church very much highlights, the, uh, excuse me, the Bible very much highlights the fact that it's not the Bible that is the pillar and bulwark of truth. It is the church that is the pillar and bulwark of truth. And it is the church that keeps the teachings and promulgates them and spreads them and teaches them and so forth. So a lot of what Pastor Sam has just said, not only would I disagree with, but I think we can find historical and patristic evidence that it is just not so, that there were things being taught from the very beginning in terms of Mary's honor and veneration. I tried to mention Gregory the Wonder Worker from the early 200s, the papyrus from the year 250, there clearly was a body of evidence that seems to indicate Marian veneration was very, very early in the church. And when we start getting into the 300s, the early 300s, we start seeing even more of that, <coughs> continuing the tradition that was handed down to them and then beyond. <coughs> this, this is why knowledge of scripture is important. So the reference that's made to the church being the pillar, let's look at that. First Timothy 3 verses 14 to 16. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things. Notice here, writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. 
Paul is literally saying here, I am writing you the instructions of what you know, so even if I can't make it to you. And that's when it says afterwards, context here, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth and, and continuing onward. So that shows that Paul had an emphasis and an importance on the written instruction. And if you look at his letters, there are instructions there, for example, on the qualifications of an elder. However, when it comes to what people are practicing, uh, we see in scripture, overseer, elder, um, shepherd, all those were interchangeably used for one position. And it was later on that the bishop was removed from uh, the elder role and that the elder role was switched over to the priest role. And all those things happened afterwards in time. And, and that's why if you actually look in context, you'll see that, no, the truth was put in the word of God. So let us pay attention to the word of God and be knowledgeable about it. So when people quote part of scripture, we can look at it in context. I think what you just quoted pr proves my point. Furthermore, if we want to talk about St. Paul admonishing people to uphold what he writes, let's remember that what he wrote, he also wrote, attend to the teachings I have given you, whether by word, by epistle, or by oral tradition, he says. So we know that even in the scriptures that oral tradition was uh, elevated by St. Paul to the same level as the written word. And as he said in many of his epistles, as I have told you previously, as I wrote to you previously, we don't have all his letters. There was another letter to the Corinthians. We don't have it. There was a letter to the Laodiceans. We don't have it. But St. Paul clearly said, I've taught you a lot of stuff, some by word, some by mouth. Follow both because both are important. Both come down to you, not merely from me, but from who has taught me, and that's Jesus Christ himself. But Paul wrote that letter to the Thessalonians, and let's remember what Paul said about the Bereans, who were more faithful than the Thessalonians because they, they evaluated every word that he said and looked at the scriptures in order to evaluate what he said actually lined up with scripture. So again, context here is important. And yes, of course, there is letters that, that we don't have that Paul that wrote. That doesn't negate what I just said. You're, you're bringing something else up as an example. It's a good mm -hmm. example about the Bereans. I know that example. Yeah, but again... The admonition to follow unwritten oral tradition is given several times in Scripture, not just once by Paul. Yes, so guys, let's do this real quick. Hold on just a second, Sam. Let me give you one more rejoinder, Sam, and then let's move on to the next question. Fair enough. Uh, you said one more what, sorry? You, you can do. You can respond oh. back. Since I cut you off, go ahead and respond back. And then after sure. the response, let's move on to the next question. We only got a couple more, guys. <laughs> right. I guess, um, that when, 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 when Paul wrote the letters that he wrote, God sovereignly chose which letters would be in there in scripture and those hold the whole entire oral tradition that was passed on. So oral tradition was done as scripture was being compiled. But now that we have the living word, it's all there. That's so not that's what saints right. of the church have said. St. Beals of the Great, for example, affirms that there's many things the church d did in his day and age that were not passed down in letters. And he mentions the sign of the cross facing east when we pray and things like that. He says, this has been given to us since the time of the apostles. It was never written down. It was given orally. You would have to take his word. You would have to put your faith in his word. And St. Basil the Great, I sure will put my faith in his word. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> let's, let's move on to the next question. Okay, so Troy asked this. If God blesses and praises Mary, should we not contend? or imitate, excuse me. And Sam, I'll let you go first on this one. So again, God blesses her and we acknowledge that she's blessed. Um, and, and we talk about what she did and, and there is, is honor there, but to do anything beyond that um, of, of what we've been talking about, that's inappropriate and not something that we should be doing. And nowhere is that modeled in scripture. Father Jonathan. Well, actually, it is modeled in Scripture, and we spoke about it earlier when St. Paul talks about, you know, what you see in me and, uh, and have seen me do, imitate me, uh, which is said in a number of places. So if St. Paul can be as bold to say, imitate me as I do Christ, then certainly we can imitate Mary, who also imitated Christ. But the question is not on imitation. The question is on honoring her. No, Paul, no, that's not what no, the question no is. If God blesses and praises Mary, should we not imitate? That yeah, it does say that. Imitate God in in the sense of okay, but the, what what's being talked about is the the hymns that are being sung and the way that Mary's talked about. Those are not things that were ever modeled in Scripture for things for us to do. So how can we imitate things that are not said in Scripture to do? That's not what no, no, the, the question itself. If God blesses and praises Mary, should we not imitate and and uh, that that 
blessing and praise that is given to her. Troy would have to confirm that, but that's how I'm reading what he's writing here. That, what that's what he meant. Thing. And, and again, if we're gonna if we're gonna use how God honored Mary, again, looking at Luke 11, Jesus right there when Mary was being praised in front of him, he said, "Blessed rather." Blessed rather. We could we could go into that as a word study. That's not what it means, and I just don't have the time to go into it here. I, I believe there's we have a major disagreement there on what that means. Yes, we do. All right, guys. All right, that was the last audience question. Now, I just got one more question for both of you, and then we can wrap. Um, unless Josh and Dell wants to add something in that here at the end. So, uh, Father Jonathan, my first question is for you. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, For there is not one truly righteous person on earth who continually does good and never sins. End quote. How do you reconcile this passage with the belief that Mary never committed any personal sins? The verse that you cite was written hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ and Mary walked the face of the earth. At that point in time, I have no doubt that the writer sincerely meant it. But there's nothing in that verse that says this is true at all times in every place and for all time. It's as simple as that. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Sam, do you want to give a, a, a response real quick? Well, just that I wholeheartedly disagree with that. God's word is perfect. The writer may not have known, but the Holy Spirit knew when he wrote it, and the Holy Spirit didn't make a mistake. Okay. All right. Sam, my next question is for you, and then I'll give uh, Father Jonathan a chance to respond. Uh, to your knowledge, uh, Sam, is there any evidence before the 15th century of anything that explicitly condemns the practice of venerating the Theotokos? Uh, explicit. I know Epiphanes spoke against it. Um, and I know that when you, when you look at um, uh, Helveticus, uh, his writings were obviously speaking against it. But again, they burned his writings because they called him a heretic. So there were obviously people who saw this practice. They saw it as problematic. And um, they were either ignored or silenced. Father John. I think the assumption that just because someone agrees with your point and who has been condemned by the church as a heretic is somehow right is a bad way of looking at what happened with Helvidius and the others uh, about whom Jerome writes. I have something here I can I can read about that uh, and what the early church believed regarding uh that let me let me get this quote from jerome um so we can have something intelligent to talk about here because it, it is very interesting to consider what others have said about um about this so let, let me find that um i'm sorry this is going to take me just a moment but let me see if i can find that quote from jerome because we, it's true that we don't have anything from Helvidius. We don't have a lot of things from Arius. We don't have a lot of things from Nestorius. We don't have a lot of things from the people who were condemned by the church as heretics. Perhaps rightly so, in my opinion. But we don't need those kind of writings to hang around. Um, Helvidius and Eunomius were Arians, by the way. Arians, and it's very interesting to, to, to note that during the time of the Arian heresy, and it is a heresy, um, the Arians, because they believed that Jesus Christ was not the eternal only begotten Son of God, but a creature like you and I, because they believed that, they had to deny much about Mary and much about what the church believed at the time and was starting to, to bring into open worship at the time. Um, so, son of a gun, I can't find what I'm looking for. Uh, these quotes from. Well, may, may I make a point? Rome, because he's one of the. He's really the only person who wrote about them. He's the only person from whom we have anything uh, about uh, Helvidius and so forth. And what about Epiphanes, who's a saint in the church, who warned against um, pretty Mary in that way? Yeah, Epiphanius is the only person who ever did. The fact that you have one saying it and hundreds saying the exact opposite is proof of nothing but that he was wrong. That, that's not, again, what scripture says. Majority doesn't rule. That's not, how, that's not how scripture works. The majority of the religious elite in Jesus' day would have all condemned Jesus, and they were the majority. That doesn't necessarily make what they're saying right. Epiphanes was looking and, and pointing out that what they're doing is, is a clear violation of scripture. And even the earliest fathers didn't do this. This, this is something that evolved 
and he responded to it and people ignored it. Here's the quote from Jerome, by the way. Helvidius produces Tertullian as a witness. Tertullian was also a heretic, by the way, who left the church for Montanism. Helvidius produces Tertullian as a witness to his view and quotes Victorinus, bishop of wherever. Of Tertullian, I say no more than that he did not belong to the church. But as regards Victorinus, I assert what has already been proven from the gospel that he, Victorinus, spoke of the brethren of the Lord, not as being sons of Mary, but brethren in the sense I have explained. That is to say, brethren in point of kinship, not by nature. By discussing such things, we are following the tiny streams of opinion. Might I not array against you the whole series of ancient writers, Ignatius, Polycarp, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, and many other apostolic and eloquent men, against whom, or who against, the heretics, Ebion, Theodorus, Valentinius, held these same views and wrote volumes replete with such wisdom. If you have ever read what they wrote, you would be a wiser man. So the idea that Helvidius had anything to say was rejected by Jerome in the early church. The fact that Epiphanius had anything to say was also rejected by the entire church, who by 431 in the Third Ecumenical Council, and that is the highest, um, you might say, um, entity of authority in the church other than scripture itself, by the way. Yeah, but when and Jerome anybody who said it, anything other than Mary was a perpetual virgin and so forth was condemned at that council. And if Epiphanius did, and I haven't seen the entire proceeds of that council, then he was wrong, simply. And, and just it should be noted here, so when people are looking at this, when Jerome says that these early fathers um, uh, uh, agreed with the perpetual um, virginity of Mary and all these other things, we don't have the writings. We're, we would have to put our faith in Jerome's words. And, and again, it just, that should be noted that when he's saying that, uh -oh. we don't have any evidence of that. Well, this is very funny that when people don't agree with you, you question their veracity like you did with St. Basil the Great, like you're doing with Jerome. I choose to believe that these great men uh, spoke the truth and were writing against uh, very bad teaching, very divisive teaching, very disrespectful teaching. Uh, but he does quote Helvidius at point. He says, you, Helvidius, say that Mary did not remain a virgin. As for myself, I claim that Joseph himself was a virgin through Mary so that a virgin son might be born of a virginal wedlock. Anyway, it goes on and on uh, of the different fathers uh, going up to the fifth century. Ambrose, Augustine, Didymus the Blind, John Chrysostom, Epiphanius of Salmus, not the one you quoted, but another one. Gregor of Nyssa, Basil the Great, Athanasius, Hilary of Poitiers, Ephraim the Syrian. I mean, the, the testimony to her ever virginity is voluminous. And the fact that you can find one man, Epiphanius, who may be a saint in the church, who said something the church does not teach or believe or agree with, is not proof necessarily that Epiphanius didn't deserve to be a saint. Gregory of Nyssa, by the example, one of the great saints of the early church, wrote stuff and submitted it to the church and said, I don't know if this is right or not, but here, you, you tell me in time whether I was right or not. And in time, the church said, no, Gregory, your stuff is not right. And uh, there are some things that he wrote that the church has excluded from wanting to be read because he was wrong. But Epiphanius was simply wrong, not right because he was standing all by himself on scripture. And, and no, he was wrong. And everybody who lived during his time and after has said so. So to clarify two things, the question asked was if somebody said something, and I mentioned the stuff that at least I know off the top of my head, and also, it should be noted that I am not making my argument from these people in church history. I'm basing my argument from Scripture and Scripture alone. So, yes, you, you're putting your faith in what these people say because you trust what they say is true. I'm putting my faith in the Word of God because I believe that that is sufficient and true. And these people that you say I'm putting my faith in them, I'm putting my faith in them because these were extremely learned men who read the Scriptures in Greek, knew the Scriptures in Greek, studied the Scriptures in Greek, read them in church, knew the context— and so forth, and they are the best Bible expositors the church has ever known. Now, furthermore, I put my faith in the scriptures as well, but these men know a hell of a lot more than I do about the scriptures and how they should be interpreted, which is why you and I can open the scriptures and we can look at something and we can have a big disagreement about what it means, but I can turn to the fathers and say, but it's not just my opinion. This is what the church consistently has taught and believed from the beginning. And you can't do that. So what's the difference when the, when the Pharisees quoted the rabbis and based that their tradition came down from Moses? 
They said that their traditions came down from Moses and they kept quoting at nausea the rabbis. Yet Jesus, they said in the scriptures, taught in a completely different way, in a way with authority. Not because the people even realized that he was God because they didn't realize it, but because he was quoting scripture and using it in context. What are we supposed to model? What the Pharisees were rebuked for or what Jesus did when he taught with authority? Interesting that Jesus said to the people when he spoke about the Pharisees, what you hear them do, what you hear them teach you, do it. But don't do what they do. And and what is and what is that? What is he referring to when they're talking about what Scripture is talking about? Those are yes, the things you're supposed to do. He's talking about Scripture. The Pharisees taught from the Scriptures. They and, taught from the Law. They taught from the Prophets. The Sadducees didn't teach from the Prophets. They didn't believe in them. Correct. They taught, but, and when they taught, Jesus said, "When they teach you something, listen to it and do it. If it's from the Law, but don't." Yes, do if it's from do. the Law, that's the key part. If it's from they the were law, hypocrites if, because they taught the Law, but they didn't follow the Law. Well, no, the big problem was they also taught their 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 tradition of the elders in in conjunction with the law as if it was on the same level. And that's the problem. If there is an early father who says a quote and it lines up with scripture, we can use that. We can use that as, as a faithful quote. But once they bring in the traditions of men and put it at the same equation as scripture at the same level, that's what the Pharisees were doing. And that's why Jesus says, follow what they're saying in the sense of if it's in the word of God, but don't act like them when they put on their Corban rules and all their other traditions and hold it to that. This is something you must follow. Well, there's a big difference between Jesus admonishing the people to follow or not to follow the Pharisees and to follow or not to follow the church fathers. The Pharisees were not filled with the Holy Spirit. The church fathers were. They were part of the body of Christ. They were bishops of the body of Christ. They had they had been handed to them. They had passed down to them the apostolic deposit of faith. Straight from the apostles, many of these men were not many generations removed from that period of time. They knew what they were teaching, and it was right, sound teaching, because it came right from the apostles and through them from Jesus Christ himself. That's the big difference between how the uh, church fathers taught and how the Pharisees taught. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, for the exchange. Uh, we really appreciate it. We're at the three hour and 12 minute mark. And so y'all have been on a roll tonight and I appreciate the time that you've both again dedicated. Uh, I did want to make a quick announcement. And so we had mentioned at the very first Josh did about uh, this help for the homeless uh, activity that he's going to be participating in. The links are not on YouTube, but they are on StreamYard. So I don't know if why they're not popping up on YouTube. I've got them on all three. So Real Seekers, Faith Unaltered, and CSG, everywhere this is streaming uh, right now, I've put his links in the description, uh, but for some reason they're not showing up on YouTube. And so please don't let that discourage you uh, from uh, not donating to this, this awesome cause. Please send me an email, faithunaltered at gmail.com. Contact Josh on Facebook. And we will get you those links uh, to, to be able to uh, to donate and, and support Josh and Emily uh, for doing that. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I don't understand why that they're not showing up. They're in the description. I sent Josh a picture showing that they're in the description on StreamYard, uh, but they're not showing up on YouTube. Uh, Josh, real quick, uh, where if people uh, don't want to email or whatever, where can they can you give the link uh, to uh, like her Venmo account or and I'll put it uh here, let me make a a banner real quick. What what's her Venmo name? Uh yeah, her 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 Venmo name is actually uh let me let me pull this back up right here. Uh let's see. Okay. It is Venmo.com slash wait, hold on pretty far back em okay. emily dash davidson 13 right yeah it's venmo.com forward slash u the letter u forward slash emily dash davidson one three so that's her venmo uh and her her paypal is uh a little bit more complex so we'll probably uh, copy and paste that one yeah i'll uh i'll i'll again try to put that in the description but if y'all got venmo i got her uh name up just go to venmo.com and or if you have the app, uh, you'll see a search function, uh, search for a user at Emily dash Davidson 13 uh, and she will pop up. So, again, uh, don't let that uh, the links not being there discourage you from donating. And then if you want her PayPal, 
uh, either hit uh, me up, faithunaltered at gmail.com, or send Josh a message on Facebook or email him. What's your email, bud? Uh, my email is joshua d at bay area rescue dot org. And just for good measure, I'm going to post both of those links in the comments afterward. Yeah. Uh, so if you, if you guys, after the video ends, if you want to uh, help out with that ministry, go ahead and just refresh the page. It'll come up in the comments section. All right. Thank you for that. So, guys, uh, again, this has been an awesome debate. Uh, I, I really, really appreciate uh, uh, Pastor Sam, Father Jonathan, to getting together uh, to do round two. It was definitely not a letdown by any stretch of the imagination. And so thank you again. I can't wait to go back, listen, start making my list uh, of points uh, to, to, you know, really think about. And, um, and yeah, so uh, Josh uh, or Dell, do you guys have any final closing thoughts? And then I will take us out. Uh, well, in the spirit of my tradition, uh, personally, Are I'm, you going pleased? Say, I'm going to say I'm <laughs> pleased with how this went. I'm very pleased. I already put a funny screenshot on Facebook about how I feel about this uh, stream tonight was so fantastic. Uh, got passionate, got a little heated, but that's to be expected with, with these things. Again, we take these things seriously. It's no wonder we get, we get passionate. We get, we yeah. get filled with, with just the desire to express truth in the best way that we know how. And so um, in the spirit of, 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 uh, the, 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 de the, the debate and the discussion so far, I am just very pleased at the engagement at the, 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 the fire, the directness, but also, uh, the, the good manners and the, 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 uh, the, the yielding to one another that, that it just, this, this all was very fantastic for me. And I feel like I'm going to look back on this as one of those times when, uh, uh, when, when, when you know, our, our ability to adjust as we go is something that can be a really good example to other people who are going to have conversations about disagreement. And I thank you guys very much for your, for your, not only your vast wealth of information and knowledge on these topics, but also your attitude and your passion and your desire to, to, to articulate these things as clearly as possible. This was fantastic. Absolutely. And, you know, I just want to say something real quick. There was a there was a comment that came up earlier and I'm not bashing Ringo or anything. He had, he's entitled to his own opinion, whatever. But he said the channel was a lot better uh, before we started doing the, all this orthodox stuff. And my my thing is to that as the owner and executive producer and co and co-host of Faith Unaltered and CSG, um, I, I want to say this. I'm not infallible by any stretch of the imagination. And so I don't care what you call yourself. If you have a legit understanding of Christianity, if you call yourself a Christian by any stretch of the imagination, you can and are more than welcome. I don't care who you are to come on this show. You're more than welcome to, because guess what? I could have it wrong. And if I don't, and if I don't put the content out there and if I don't consume it just because I don't like something, maybe uh, then, then we're never going to come to truth. Right. And so, so I don't care if you're Protestant, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, you have a seat on this show. And if somebody don't like that, then, then unsubscribe. I don't care. Um, so with that being said, Dale, any last, uh, comments that you would like to say, if you are still there? Yep. Uh, there he is. You can hear me. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, um, well, and I guess in the first place, yeah, thank you for addressing, addressing that because obviously, Ringo Cat is a friend of ours. Right? Yeah, he's he's been with us forever. I consider him a friend and stuff. He's he's not just a number. So, yeah, I respect his opinion. You know, he has the right to subscribe or unsubscribe as he sees fit, um, and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, he, he's a friend. I value his opinion and that sort of thing. And yeah, um, just like we do with Marvin Wallace, I'll give him a shout out. He's in the comments, and he had the opposite opinion. He thinks this was an awesome discussion, and the show gets better and better. So he likes he likes that. So. Turning to the two guests, yeah, I just want to say thank you guys for doing this debate. Um, yep, the, there was uh, a moment there where it got a little bit heated and stuff like that. Okay, fine, but there is some good, so all I care about is the substantive information. That's what I'm going to be basing my opinion on because in the same way as I, you know, I, I'm friends with Marvin or Ringo in the audience, I'm also friends with Tyler, and this is an issue of that he's going through. He's he's a catechumen in the Orthodox Church. Um, so I, as his friend, I want to do my best to 
you know, understand the Orthodox position and the Protestant position and make an informed case as to what I think is right and then let Tyler Tyler decide and ultimately it's up to him. But um, yeah, I'm going to be using the information I got from Father Jonathan and Pastor Sam to do my best to argue the Protestant Protestant side, which is what I believe is true. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, we're friends, Tyler. So yeah, great, great show, guys. Thank you very much for, for your contributions. Dale, I think you and I have had more hours off of air than we've ever done with Eastern Orthodoxy on air. So this it, it's good for me. And, and, you know, I love you too, brother. I love Ringo and I love uh, uh, everybody, you know, that subscribes, that, that even comes in and watches the show. And so with that, we thank you. And until next time, good night, God bless, and stay like Christ. <laughs>